this is not going to be. This is what's left for the change. It's just his first sentence. Where else then? Where is he going to go now? Let's closer. Yeah. Right? I emailed the squad. Closer point, right? That's not part of it. So this I was not recommended. I will from Hawaii on Tuesday. Yes. However, I we recommend tried, that. Paige tried to talk Megan to come to Florida for the summer and working down there. And I was like, no, I'm staying at home. And I'm like, Tori, you can move forward. Yay! Right. So that was discussed by. Yeah, Cindy was like, I'm not going to be too because he's got his. Okay. That's fine, I can share. We're good. Yeah, we're good. The audience did request that we all use the microphones. Okay. We had a hard time hearing before. What's that? We had a hard time hearing before. Yes. For me, means every day, I pretty much end the day and not being caught up from I the days. Like I told you before, though, most everyone I work with is on Central Time, so my normal nights go till like 6:30 or later because that's only 5:30 Central Time. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Just because. But I catch that extra hour break in the morning usually. So there you go. Call to order Brandywine Community Schools. Hold on, let me turn this on. Call to order Brandywine Community Schools Board of Education regular meeting Monday, May 22nd, 2023. The time now is 6.30 p.m. Ms. Seastrom, could you do the roll call, please? Is your microphone on? Yeah, it's on. Mr. Fox? How about that? Yeah. Is that better? Test. Uh, yeah. That better? Good. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, Ms. Seastrom, please do roll call. Mr. Payne? Here. Mr. Burge? Here. Mrs. Crouch? Here. Ms. McCombs? Here. Mrs. McKee? Here. Mrs. Pomeranka? Here. Mr. Walker? I'm present. And I am present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Now we move to the approval of the, the agenda. I'd like to make a motion to move the monthly academic highlight to the beginning of the meeting. I second that. Any other discussion? All right, we'll, we'll vote for that. All those in favor of moving the academic 
highlights to the front of the meeting. Say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. So we'll move that to the front of the meeting and now we'll vote on the rest of the agenda. All those in favor of approving the remainder of the agenda, say aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, there's motion. not a motion. Oh. I need a motion to for the approval of the rest of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. I'll second. All right, thank you. Any any discussion? All those in favor of approving the remainder of the agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. 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 And we had four to three, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. Any uh, hearing from the visitors? P.O. Box 85, Galeen, Michigan. At the Board of Education meeting on 3-13-2023 at 1 hour 42 minutes during the publicly available recording, we heard the following regarding NEOLA 5511, which is for student dress and grooming. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for the thorough coverage of all these options. Quoting Mr. Walker's reading of this, I do recommend that in Part A, we adopt at the building level with changes the language to designate the principal as the arbiter of student dress and grooming. It takes out the language in his or her building and just at the building level. I would recommend that we adopt that. The other option, if the board chooses, again, this is optional, and it is to direct students to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory and uniform manner, including without regard to whether a student is transgender or gender non-conforming. He goes on to state, we still have to abide by it whether the option is adopted or not. Then a month later at the board meeting titled, Board Meeting 424, 2023, Part 2. At one hour, 19 seconds, the board president states, there's a recommendation that we emphasize, and I gotta read that language, direct staff to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory and uniform manner. He goes on to state, I think I made that recommendation. I just wanted to make the emphasis that we enforce it in an unbiased and non-discriminatory way. Any questions on that? End quote. I do have a question on that. Why was the following wording removed, which stated, including without regard to whether a student is transgender or gender nonconforming? Based on the discrepancy and the change, it is my hope the following will occur tonight for agenda item number 11, part F. Number one, I hope to hear the full language read out today by Mr. Walker if it were to be adopted with all changes as presented during the revision from the April 24th meeting. Two, I'd love to hear discussion around this before the vote happens. The reason is, if the vote is truncated language, the community deserves the benefit of understanding why the language recommendation was truncated by Mr. Payne. In other words, leaving the section out about transgender and nonconforming. We can hear the reasoning for that being dropped so it doesn't just slip past and get voted on as is. My opinion is, if the board leadership is actively working during these meetings to remove all ambiguity about their beliefs around pornography and sexually explicit material, maybe the board leadership is willing to remove all ambiguity about their regard for the marginalized community of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. Third, I hope to hear a roll call vote on this action item specifically for the reasons I previously stated. I have previously read public statements by one or more board members stating they are not homophobic and they are not transphobic. I want to see if actions match words as they relate to the wording of this specific policy. In conclusion, if I were voting as a board member and the wording matched the 313 reading, I'd vote yes. If I were voting, voting for the 424 version, which I believe has dropped references to transgender and gender nonconforming students, I'd strongly consider abstaining so I could tell the community my conscious required inclusion of the wording for transgender and gender nonconforming students and community members to get a yes from me. I will use this. How's that? 
All right, you, sh you guys should all have copies of the operating budget. You have to face the microphone for it to work. This is five months of this. Um, we're on the monthly academic highlight right now. No, oh, we are. All right, Mr. Walker, could you do the academic highlight, please? Mrs. Skinner, we are ready for you. Here we have, would you like to tell everybody your name? Or not? <laughs> we would, we're, not we do, we're not going to share our names. Yeah. We got this. What have you done in STEM? Can you remember? What about the snowman? Is it on? Yeah. What about the snowman? Do you remember doing the snowman? What yes. Did, what did we do? Can you remember? We, we um, dot the small snowman. We did dots for the small snowman people. This was very, very cool. And we did um, Matisse. Matisse. Matisse what? Oh, I remember. Yeah. We did Matisse. It's a snail. It's a snail. Say snail. Snail? Snail. We did a Matisse snail people. It was awesome, right? All right. Let's move on to first grade. Yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. My name is Ellie Evelyn Sadison. Thank you, Ellie. And what did you do in STEM this year? Um, we, did, we learned about caterpillars and how, like, if they're in the sun for too long, they, like, die and stuff like that. How, how did you find that out? Um, because you told us and we did it like beads. <laughs> I did. I really did. Yes. Um, we had, we've had some beads, didn't we? And into the shape of a... The beads were in the shape of a... Yeah. A caterpillar. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, when they're, they were in the sun for too long, they would, like, change colors. Ooh, they changed colors, people. Mm-hmm. And then when you put them in the house... They go back to white. Right. Very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Kinsley. I'm Cameron. We have been doing apple contests where we made a little stand for the apples and we had to make sure they didn't fall off. We did a squirrel, which we had to make a house for the squirrel. Do you share anything else or is that it? That's it. That's it, thank you very much, awesome. Now on to the biggies, third grade. My name is Sadie, and what we learned this year, it's kind of surprising. We use, it's kind of like a kid's game. We actually do coding, which is very surprising because my uncle actually uses coding to program computers, and we're learning that in third grade, but in a kid's way. Fourth grade. 
Hello, my name is Lillian Monjo. I am here representing the fourth grade at Brandywine. <laughs> I, I personally enjoy STEM, S-T-E-M, or STEM a lot. I would like to share some of my favorite projects with you all. Once we built a flower from supplies in the classroom. I learned how plants get energy, reproduce, and how they protect themselves. One of my favorite projects was snap circuits, where we learned how to direct energy. I learned how to use them to make a light turn on. The third project was learning about computer coding. I learned how to code using programming blocks. The last project was light in the window house. I learned how to use copper tape and a battery to make a light turn on. I also built a, a house and put the light in it. Thank you. All right, Piggies, are we ready? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Are we allowed to have a board on the table so you can see? Absolutely, if that's what you would like to do. Very quickly, though, because everybody's waiting. Sorry, people, we Hello, my name is Beatrice, and in STEM, we did um, iRobots. iRobot, um, mm, Minecraft. Minecraft is a creative outlet for any kid just to let their imagination flow and build whatever they want. For STEM, we were allowed to make our own plastic waste factory, where you were told to make something that would transfer plastic waste to a factory. I think that Minecraft is a very cool resource for kids like us to make whatever we'd like. And the next thing we did was edgy boxes. Edgy boxes are wooden boxes that have many locks, and they are basically mini escape rooms. But you are not trying to get inside, not outside, but with clues to help you get inside. When we did it, it was themed to the novel we were reading in ELA called Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Once we got inside, we were rewarded with Starburst candies. My name is Peyton, and we did iRobots. iRobots is a, well, an app where your Chromebook and there is a robot that you have to put a marker in and you have to program it to do what you want. And then there's like a whiteboard. And you set the robot on the whiteboard. And then are, there are settings where you can hit the top bumper and then you can make it go and do what you want. We also did 3D pins. 3D pins are where you have to put the filament on the top and wait for it to heat up. And then when you're ready, you can get a rubber mat which is for the filament to go on. You can make a design and put it on paper under the mat, and then you can trace your design. We also did Black Souls. Black Souls is an app where you can make your own design. So first, you create your design and put it on paper. And once your design, you can, you can put it in a box and start creating your design on the app for the Black Souls. And when your design is in the app, you can create and test it and do what you like and have it jump and turn into robot or anything you want. One more thing we also did, which was really fun, we used uh, a website called Tinkercad and um, made our objects and pr 3D printed them out on a 3D printer. And when we were done, we went to the Merritt Elementary and hid them in a um, like the trail that they have. and. When we put them in the trail, we, were, we took kindergarten and first grade and walked through the trail so they could try and find the objects we hid. Science. Science is learning about the world and nature elements through observation. Technology. Computers and a modern way of industry. Engineering. The process of creating a solution to solve the problem. Math. The study of numbers and how they are related to each other and used in the real world. There is our amazing presentation from our STEM. Students, thank you very much. Be Students, before you sit down, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have not been able to see all of your projects, but I've been in there during uh, the creation of your bees and the tents, and that is some very impressive stuff. You guys are doing great work. Um, I am not an artist, so definitely some of those bumblebees you guys created, way above my level, so great job. Thank you for being here tonight.
Okay, next on the agenda is the Beer and Reese General Fund operating budget resolution. You should have the copies of the operating budget, the general fund operating budget resolution, and the 2023-2024 Beer and Reese operating budget. Any questions? And this is just a discussion item. Um, uh, at the next meeting, we will uh, read the resolution in its in in its entirety, uh, but certainly if there's any questions or Mr. Walker, if you want any comments you want to share. Yeah, we have uh, Mr. Nolan, Mr. Hopstock here from, from RISA that can uh, just share a little bit more in detail uh, about that. Okay, um, my name is Scott Noel. Um, as as uh, Mr. Walker said, I'm the Director of Business and Finance at Barry and Risa. Um, annually, we um, present our general fund budget to the school boards of each district um, within Barry and County so that they can approve our general fund budget. The general fund budget is the only budget that needs to be approved by the boards. I'll give a quick presentation of our special ed fund budget too, just so you can see where we're going with that as well. Um, briefly, our budgeting objectives, obviously we want to retain, retain a sufficient fund balance to continue the longevity and the, and the solid operations of the district. Um, we'd like to avoid borrowing at all costs unless strategically we deem that to be, um, to de deem that to be appropriate. Uh, we'd like to avoid employee layoffs, program reductions. We always want to try to look forward to see what we can see coming in the future so we can prepare for that kind of thing. We're trying to maintain competitive employee compensation packages, maximize our services to the local districts, which are, which are many. Um, we want to continue with our special education uh, reimbursements to the districts, which is basically a distribution of our excess equity over a, an established amount. Um, and then that gets distributed pro rata based on a headcount and unfunded special ed costs to each district. Um, also maintain community partnerships. Um, we want to maintain a strong presence in the community that we're located in, the community that we serve. So what, what I've done here in preface to talking about the general fund and special ed fund budgets is kind of show you where we typically end up with these budgets because the initial budgets are done with very few assumptions put in place. We only, we only put in what we know. We're doing our budgeting at the end of March, beginning of April. That's a very early time period to do a budget. We don't have a state budget in place yet. We don't have federal grant amounts yet. Um, so I assume a lot of flat numbers from a revenue point of view. Um, but from a general fund point of view, you can see that we have a, a, a pretty good trend over the last um, 10 years of producing a surplus. We have, a, a, I think, only one year that we did not produce a surplus um, over the course of the last 10 years. The general end surplus is nominal, but it has allowed us to build up a very healthy general fund balance that's uh, just over the 20 percent um, mark, which is, um, by state standards, a healthy fund balance. Similarly, on the special ed side, Although this preliminary budget doesn't reflect it, we typically end up with a healthy surplus on the special ed fund uh, side as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we're one of two ISDs in the state of Michigan that actually takes that surplus and we distribute it to the districts, put it back in so that they, they can use it for their special ed costs um, and help keep the program strong throughout the, throughout the county. Salaries, as in most cases with most districts, are a very large percentage of the total expenses. So, so that's really the biggest assumption that goes into the expense side, or what are the salary increases going to be. These percentages just reflect salaries. They don't reflect overall compensation. Um, but we're, you know, we're looking at uh, special ed salaries are about anywhere from 35 to 40 percent 
of overall expenses. And on the general, uh, on the general fund side, uh, where obviously we have markedly fewer employees, the overall expenses um, are complemented by 20 to 25 percent uh, salaries. So that's just kind of a trend of where we've been, and, and so, so you can get an idea of what these funds normally do on a regular basis. Um, the initial budget that we put in place, um, I assumed just um, to be conservative, which I usually am, I assumed for both funds that taxable values would increase by 2 percent, um, thereby bringing us additional tax dollars uh, into the district. Um, there were rumblings that it could have been closer to 4 or 5 percent, that it was going to be a solid year of taxable, but I didn't have anything significant, so I used 2 percent. In reality, we just found out last week that that increase is actually 8 percent. So um, when I revise these budgets and bring them to our board for uh, an amendment and approval as we go into the new year, it'll include that 8 percent. Um, when I originally did these budgets, we were in the middle of contract negotiations. We have three-year uh, con contract that was up this year, so um, I didn't list in the assumptions what the, what the uh, salary increase assumptions that I used were because I didn't want to hinder the progress of the negotiations, but I can tell you that I used 4 percent um, for, I used 4 percent for salary increases across the district. Um, and I believe that as things turn out with the negotiations, that's what we'll be pretty close to. I think so. I think on the cost side, we're a little bit more accurate here. Um, the insurance costs are reflecting our current run rates of what our insurance expenditures are as a percentage of salary. And I do it as a percentage of salary just because it makes it easier to allocate evenly across each area of the district. Um, all of my state and federal grants remain fully funded, but at flat amounts. I don't have any information that will give me any, any, anything better than that, so I don't want to increase those amounts erroneously. All state aid categories, I assume, flat. Um, as we see the budgets develop in Lansing, I can see that the state aid probably is going to go up. Uh, the three budget proposals out there all show some pretty significant increases. Um, so those will eventually be built in, but are not currently built into this budget. Um, on the general fund side, for purposes of this budget, we are not adding any FTEs to the general fund for 2023-24. Um, so flat head count, if you will. We did add $80,000 to the general fund balance for audiovisual equipment for all of our conference rooms throughout our facility. Um, those conference rooms are used on a pretty regular basis every, every week of the year. Uh, and some of the AV equipment is getting a little bit outdated. So we're going we're gonna to freshen that up. And I also have just under $300,000 of capital spending in the general fund for next year. It's unusual. We don't normally have a lot of capital spending in the general fund. Um, we've recently had an assessment done at Barry and Risa, and we're going to try to start um, budgeting some capital so we can knock a few things off over the next five years that are just uh, housekeeping things, things that need to be freshened up and things that need to be done. Uh, around the, the administrative offices. On the special ed side, we did add a couple of FTEs. I included the addition of a behavior specialist. Uh, it's a $68,000 salary, $115,000 total cost. And we're adding a school nurse uh, with a salary of $42,000, a total cost of $80,000. Uh, there's an additional $2 million of capital spending on the, general, on the special ed fund side. That's pretty consistent with where we've been. We've done a major renovation at Blossom Land Learning uh, Center, and that renovation is just about wrapping up. But there's other facilities, um, Lighthouse uh, specifically, that have kind of been ignored over the years, and we need to do some we need to do some work over there. So um, our park, our uh, transportation facility, and Lighthouse, uh, and a little bit of cleanup stuff at. at, at uh, blossom land result in about two million dollars of capital spending for the special ed fund. So with those assumptions all put together, basically what we're looking at for 23-24 is I, I have a current projection of a $459,000 deficit on the general fund side. Um, keep in mind we're, we're, we're definitely light on the revenues. Um, I suspect there'll be state aid increases. I know that there's going to be six percent higher taxable value increases. Um, I suspect that by the time this general fund 
budget gets finalized, it will be consistent with where we've been over the, been over the last few trend years. Not a significant surplus, but a surplus um, that'll continue to keep our, our fund balance strong and healthy. On the special ed fund side, um, a, a little bit more uh, alarming of a number, I'm currently proposing a $630,000 deficit on the special ed side. Uh, again, that's after $2 million of capital spending, but um, we have that 6% to add to the local revenue from the taxes, and on the, on the special ed fund side, that 6%, uh, every 1% of taxable value on special ed is about $185,000. So that's going to just about wipe out that deficit right there, and that doesn't include any increases in state aid or potentially in federal grant funding. Um, I've assumed all the same federal grants as prior years. I haven't assumed any new federal grants, but again, I've left them all at, at flat, uh, flat revenue. So two FTE ads on the special ed side, no FTE ads on the general fund side. Um, kind of business as usual, with the exception of some capital spending that uh, we hope to get done and, and get approved into the final budget. Um, because we have, like I said, we have a five-year plan at this point of capital spending, and we want to keep pace with that so we don't have to keep pushing it out. Um, that's all I have uh, as far as the budget goes. Does anybody have any questions about either the, uh, again, the general fund budget is the one that you're signing the resolution on, but I'm happy to answer questions on, on either budget if there are any questions. to the special ed to the local districts for this year? Has it been uh, This year, I believe the total was uh, 2.3 million, and that's a combination of excess equity and Act 18 money, which is a piece of the tax revenue we get that actually gets distributed back to the different. So we refer to it as excess equity, but it's actually the Act 18 money and the excess equity combined. And it was 2.3, maybe 2.5, uh, million this year uh, that went back. Um, we have a pretty good, again, and I don't have that graph with me, but if you take a look at the last 10 years of, um, of excess equity slash Act 18 distributions, we've distributed over $40 million back to districts over the last 10 years. So it, it, it really um, is a way to keep us from, from just you know, b building a, a massive fund balance that's just sitting and not being used and putting that money back to work and helping the districts cover some of their costs as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now we move on to finance the payment of district bills. The amount is $2,222,972.32. Any questions for Mr. Wilburn? Okay. Um, chair recommends that we approve paying the district bills. Is there a motion to do so? I'll make the motion. Support. Any discussion? All those in favor of paying the district bills, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Motion carried. I move to the superintendent's report, Mr. Walker. So May is uh, quite the month to celebrate educators. Um, first off, we started on May 5th celebrating our uh, kitchen staff, our food service team <clears throat> for School Lunch Hero Day on May 5th. If, if any of those staff members are here, please, if you would just stand and be recognized. Come on, There's come on. Okay, we know who she is. Um, <clears throat> so we, we provided lunch for them. 
as, as a favor for all that they do to to nourish our students. Um, we had we had just a lunch celebration with them. Uh, the principals were invited, and uh, of course we had cake for them and provided them with certificates. And we just want to recognize um, all the hard work that they do every day to, like I said, nourish our students. Um, w without that, they they are an absolute essential part of the educational team. Um, with without strong healthy bodies, we can't have strong healthy minds. On uh, May 8th to May 12th, we celebrated Employee Appreciation Week. Um, specifically, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, but we celebrated all employees in the district. Uh, we kicked the week off all of our employees. Uh, K-12 received uh, Brandywine t-shirts. Those t-shirts said Difference Maker. Um, and our employees, every one of them, is, is really a different make, difference maker. Uh, in the lives of our child. So we wanted to celebrate them. Uh, we provided the annual uh, breakfast on Friday, uh, as, as has been customary here. And then each building had some individual celebrations that they did within their, their, their own building. On May 12th, we celebrated School Communicators Day in honor of Kristen Bivens. Um, we know that if we don't tell our story, somebody will, especially nowadays with social media. Um, it, your story is going to get told. You want to be able to control the narrative, and we have too many great things going on in Brandywine Community Schools um, not to celebrate our students and our staff. So we added a communications director position this year, and uh, Ms. Bivens has filled that role wonderfully, and so we celebrated her on May 12th. And then on May 18th was our Speech Language Pathologist Day, uh, which we have two in the district, Jen Lawrence and Amy Tripp. Um, as, a, as a father of a child who receives speech services, uh, I am so grateful for, for all that they do. Um, I know that without them, we wouldn't be able to understand my son. So uh, they play an important part in the communication roles in education. So I wanted to take the time to highlight uh, those that we have recognized this month. Um, if we could give a round of applause for those four groups, please. Throughout the year, there is uh, School Bus Driver Day, Food Service, or School Lunch Hero Day. Um, there's days uh, for administrative assistance. Uh, there's Counselor Appreciation Weeks. Principals get a whole month dedicated to them. Uh, but there are four unique roles in the district where there doesn't seem to be a day that we can celebrate. So I wanted to take time today to celebrate our Director of Federal Programs, um, Amanda Lazat, if you'd please come forward. Our HR manager, Mandy Segerman. Our athletic director, David Seidenbender, could not be here. And our director of finance and operations, Mr. Wilburn. I am very fortunate to, to be able to work with these individuals. Obviously, Mr. Seidenbender works a lot with students in his role, uh, but as, as far as the other three go, um, in, integral part of, of helping just towards the overall general success of our school. And uh, again, without any special day of recognition, I just wanted to take time tonight to recognize them. So thank you, uh, you three, and Mr. Seidenbender out there uh, at their baseball game for, for your service to the district. Next up is our Memorial Day hours, just making sure that everybody is aware that BIA will be closed um, on Memorial Day uh, next week, Monday. And then on to the 23-24 academic calendar. Um, as I shared with the board, it was approved. Our pre-Labor Day start was approved. Um, so we will be starting again um, the 23-24 school year, the Monday before Labor Day in August, and uh, we will recognize all of the um, Berrien County RESA uh, breaks as has been previously shared. We were just waiting on that pre-Labor Day waiver to start, and that is a three-year waiver as I, as I previously shared. So at this time, uh, we are moving on. Mr. Severant is here 
um, for a parent involvement presentation. We also have uh, parent groups in the district that were not able to be here tonight for um, the uh, athletic boosters and for project graduation. Um, so, but Mr. Severn is gonna speak specifically about the partnership for children at Brandywine Community Schools. Good evening, thank you for having me tonight. The Partnership for Children is an organization that's been part of Brandywine for quite a while. The actual group had a lot of conflicts tonight when they found out about the, the date tonight. Uh, I thought I had a couple that could make it and they weren't able to. I have at least the six year history from the time that I started here, plus some back history on it. So what I brought tonight is a presentation that I shared uh, last November as we were restarting the Partnership for Children, also called the PFC. You can think of it much like a PTO or a PTA. It's a group of parents and school staff that support our kids. So the purpose of the PFC is to aid students, faculty, and staff of Merritt Elementary and Brandywine in their educational and recreational needs. Through fundraising and family activities, we, prom we promote an open communication between the administration, faculty, parents, and community to enhance our children's educational environment. Part two of their purpose is fundraising to support that mission. Some of the activities that they have hosted in the past include a Halloween trunk or treat. We've done cookies with Santa. And we had a daddy-daughter dance that was an annual tradition. PFC has also helped with fundraising to buy t-shirts for field days at both Merritt Elementary and Brandywine Elementary. At one point, PFC actually coordinated and organized a lot of the field day activities. After the pandemic, we transitioned that over to our PE teachers, and they've done a fabulous job, and we've kept with that new uh, setting. These are previous examples of things that PFC has done over the years. Some of these I was part of, some were in the historical notes, but they've done things like gift cards for the classroom for teachers, field trip funds to help support field trips to either reduce the cost or help pay for those students that couldn't afford to go on the field trip, trunk or treat, parent-teacher conference support, cookies with Santa, Santa shops, popcorn days, honor roll, the My Guy and Me dance, Nerf night, book fairs, teacher appreciation, Parent teacher conferences again, field day, t shirts, and movie nights. During the pandemic, PFC essentially shut down. So there was a group of parents that came to me at the end of last school year and said we'd really like to restart PFC and get it back up and running. So it took a bit of work to get it to get everything running. Their first meeting was in November and they've met monthly since then. Their main goal was to bring PFC back up and get it running, as well as support some of the major events that they, they wanted to see what events they could get to happen this year. So some of the accomplishments from this year. They did some fundraising. The first, they came up with a no time for fundraising fundraiser. Basically, they said, we need some money. If you'd like to give us some money, please send it our way. Uh, it was a successful fundraiser. We restarted the box tops for education, and they even opened a Venmo account so that they could receive donations online. This year, as of May 1st, they had $2,744. There have some expenses since then, including tr uh, transmitting $1,000 to help fund t-shirts for field days. So their current balance is around $1,300, I think, to start off our next school year. They did host the dance. They changed the design of it and called it My VIP and Me Dance. They, it allowed for more opportunities for any child to bring any adult that is important to them. And this included both boys and girls. Because we doubled the potential number, we did split it into two groups. So we had a Merit Dance from four to six and a Brandywine Dance from seven to nine. And it turned out to be an outstanding event that night. Parent-teacher appreciation gifts, they were a part of our um, appreciation gifts, it should say lunches and meals. They help to support parent-teacher conferences. Those can be long nights for our teachers, so they bring in host uh, meals for the families. Popcorn days at Merritt is something we haven't had in a while. It's wonderful to have the popcorn aroma Friday mornings. They did help out with the Scholastic Book Fair, and as I mentioned before, $1,000 to field day for t-shirts. 
So I was digging through my files to find pictures from this year. Some of the food that was brought, some of the families that were at the VIP dance. A lot of kids getting down and having a good time. To an outstanding DJ, Mr. Boger, who helped us out this year. So that's kind of a quick overview of what the PFC is about. What questions might you have for me tonight? Is there any chance at bringing back the kindergarten graduation? I know there's other um, schools in the area that do kind of like a parade when the seniors go through. They take a kindergartner with them, and I've seen like both in cap and gowns and just kind of giving them something to look forward to, I guess. Is there any talk of doing that? No, I don't, PFC has never been involved in anything like that. I'd, I'd just like to add, you and I have had the conversation, and I, I don't know how PFC could, could help get involved in this, but with the um, kindergarten roundup, we've talked about like a signing day just like they do for um, – for colleges when students are going off to college or they sign with a college for athletics, doing a signing day for our kindergartners and having them make a commitment, having their family make a commitment to their K-12 education at Brandywine, um, get our Bobcat in there, get pictures with them and, and make it a special event. Yeah, we've talked about some ideas. I don't know if PFC would necessarily be involved in it, but PFC has always been a part of those evenings to start recruiting new families. Of course, we want to have our families be a part as soon as they join Merritt Elementary as kindergarten families. They don't have to step into the leadership roles, but we want to get them acclimated and a part of the team. Uh, the speech that I always give at the beginning of the year with all of my new kindergarten families is they're developing in a community. Brandywine is a community. And it's the class of 2023 or the class of 2034, whatever they might be. They'll be with me for three years, but after that, it's the parents that will support each other, and they need to start to build those relationships and develop those relationships and make that pact that together their children are going to walk across that stage 13 years later because they've all supported each other. How do you reach out to do a continual reach out to parents to be involved so there's parents not, not involved right now, but obviously we want to encourage the involvement? you have like a campaign, an annual campaign, or a regular effort to uh, encourage people, or parents in particular, to get involved? Currently, the PFC was using our all-call system, so we sent emails out, texts. i trying to remember if we did a voice call or not. Oftentimes, we'll send flyers home as well. It really depends. Some of those messages make it home, some don't, so we try to blanket. We've used our Facebook group to get that, the Brandywine Facebook page to get information out. Uh, I think there were some direct calls and emails, those people that expressed interest, like at the kindergarten roundup, PFC started reaching out to those families directly. When is the next meeting? You know? The next meeting is going to be September 12th at 6 p.m. They have wrapped up for the year. The leadership team will probably meet to start doing some planning for next year. But the actual next general meeting is September 12th. I know the focus is on Merritt and Brandywine, the elementary. Have they thought about adding the middle school, high school for at least the teacher appreciation meals and stuff like that? I'm just asking. There hasn't been any discussion along those lines, no. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you for you, having Mr. us. Severin. Thank you, sir. Next up, we will hear a uh, presentation on the Teaching and Learning Council. Before you guys get started, so what I've asked Mr. Walker to do, obviously there's going to be a, a ton of information that we're going to try to absorb. Uh, feel free to ask questions at the end of the presentation, but the plan is to bring them back at the next meeting for us to, you know, develop questions and, and certainly so, so they can answer any questions we have at that time as well. Okay. The Teaching and Learning Council. Um, 
formerly known as Curriculum Council. So first of all, before we start talking about curriculum, um, I, I think it's important that we have a shared understanding of what curriculum is. Uh, this is one of the maybe muddy areas in education because if you talk with educators, if you talk with teachers, if you talk with administrators, if you talk with um, college level professors, I think everybody has a different idea of what curriculum is and how they define it. Um, I've heard fellow colleagues say that it's the state standards. Um, I've heard some people say it's the textbook that we use, and some will say that it's our daily lessons. Um, I think a very rudimentary uh, definition of, of curriculum comes from um, Merriam-Webster defines curriculum as the courses offered uh, by an educational institution. Um, I, I want to say that it is, it is much more than the courses offered. So I think a definition that we can get behind uh, as, as a team from the Teaching and Learning Council comes from education reform, and it is curriculum typically refers to the knowledge and skills students are expected to learn, which includes the learning standards and learning objectives they are expected to meet, the units and lesson, lessons that teachers teach, the assignments and projects given to students, the books, materials, videos, presentations, and readings used in a course, and the tests, assessments, and other methods used to evaluate student learning. An individual teacher's curriculum, for example, would be the specific learning standards, lessons, assignments, and materials used to organize and teach a particular course. That's pretty detailed. Um, again, something that I think we as a team can get behind. So I'm not, I I'm, I'm like to look at things very simple. So for me, um, what, what is curriculum? I think simply put, curriculum is what you teach and how you teach it. This obviously is a two-part definition. Okay, first what we teach and second, how we teach it. But the most important, most important point there is how we teach it. There is no magi magical curriculum that is gonna produce results. If there were, there would be some very rich entity somewhere that would have a not monopoly on all the canned box curriculum, materials, textbooks, um, whatever that might be. What we teach is irrelevant if all teachers are not using sound pedagogical practices. The most extraordinary curriculum in the hands of an ineffective teacher is going to pr produce minimal results. The most ineffective canned curriculum in the hands of an extraordinary teacher, I believe, will produce sound results. So our focus really here, like I said, is how are we teaching? How is it that we're delivering the education to the students more so than what we're teaching to the students? So that, that brings me to uh, the instructional core. This has three interdependent components centered around the tasks that students are doing each day. We have to take into consideration the content that we're teaching, but even more importantly than that, the students' own engagement in their learning, and then the teachers' skills and knowledge in that content. If you change any one of these components of this triangle, everything changes. Each year we have students come to us with different skill sets, different backgrounds, and we can't expect to teach each child the same way. Um, even in the same year from class to class, we have to employ different strategies. If we just work off of a canned curriculum and we just present material as it is in that textbook, uh, we, we really would be doing a great disservice to our, to our learners. Um, again, you have teachers with different skill sets. I'll use the example when I taught math. Um, I was very knowledgeable in algebra, in algebra two, but I'm a very visual and spatial person. So when I taught geometry, um, I, I know that I came alive differently in that classroom than I did teaching algebra in algebra two until I learned better ped pedagogical practices to teach algebra and algebra two, at which time it became more exciting for me. But again, each year you have new students coming to you with, with again, different backgrounds, um, different histories, different fundamental skill sets. And you ch like I said to start, you change one piece in this triangle and, and the way we teach changes drastically. Thank you. 
So we do have a steering committee within the district of about 27 members. This formerly was called the Curriculum Council. We've changed the name of that to the Teaching and Learning Council, and we'll go into detail as to why we changed that name in a little bit. But in 21-22, at the end of the school year, after having been in my role for about nine months, um, I received a lot of feedback from many of the folks who had historically served on that council. I myself, when I was a teacher here, was also a department chair and was a member of that council. And there was a lot of going to meetings, listening to presentations about new curriculum, and then deciding whether or not we were going to allow the math department to adopt this or allow the kindergarten ELA teachers to teach this. And many people felt like, if I'm a high school math teacher, why should I my voice mean the same as a kindergarten ELA teacher when it comes to adopting those materials. So we looked at how can we really center the voices of all of the people who are involved in these important decisions. And that's why we developed a collaborative vision for the Teaching and Learning Council. As you can see, it's up there. And it says, collaboratively, we will empower Brandywine students and staff by promoting engaging teaching and learning opportunities implementing evidence-informed instructional strategies and taking meaningful steps to ensure a rigorous, aligned, guaranteed, and viable curriculum for all Brandywine students as they grow into tomorrow's global citizens. And one way that we have made this more of a tangible concept for all of our stakeholders is talking about um, people making chefs instead of cooks. And as teachers, there's an art to teaching, but there's also a science to teaching. And the best teachers balance those two things. They follow a specific set of guidelines, standards, curriculum, but they also add in their own personality and their own flavor to make that accessible to students. So we believe this video somewhat illustrates that concept of producing chefs upon graduation as opposed to producing a traditional cook. This is a lengthy video that um, you, could go, you could go through and watch. We're just going to show about the first two minutes of this. We know, um, having been in the field of education collectively, the four of us over 60 years, three of us over 60 years, 
um, that when we talk about teacher efficacy, um, and John Hattie, one of the pioneers of some of the most influential educational research, that collective teacher efficacy, or that idea that as educators, when we work together, when we embrace all students, even if we're a high school teacher and we look at merit students and we look at the elementary students and say they are all our students we need to take responsibility for their success and for their achievement and preparing them for that next step that's the concept of collective teacher efficacy and that's what we've done a lot of work around over the past couple of years is changing those mindsets to well i'm only responsible for these 28 kids in my classroom this year to the fact that we are all in this together and we are all contributing to our students' future success. Be more set. What does that mean? Well, what I usually ask is So when we look at who were we then as a curriculum council versus who we are now, there are some similarities, but there are also some key differences that I'd like to point out. So when we looked at who we were then, we were a group of dedicated professionals. That has not changed. We were experts in our field. We had the department chairs and the grade level chairs representing their respective groups. That has not changed. We are trying our best at all levels to support our students. That has not changed. Now, there was some informal collaboration happening in little pockets here and there. So as a middle school social studies teacher, I might talk to a middle school ELA teacher and say, how can what I'm teaching in my classroom support what you're learning? But that was happening, like I said, in little pockets and informally. So we built in some structures for some more formal collaboration K-12. Um, also, we've started an intervention team, which you've heard a little bit about related to MTSS, and you will hear some more about in a moment. We had some inconsistent tier one instruction across some of our classes, and instead we've moved to generating uh, inventory of materials and assessments that are being used, because in order to know where we are going, we have to get a clear picture of where are we currently and identifying those gaps. So we've done that work as a TLC. There was no formal district-wide intervention system before for tier two and tier three. We've worked on that. Um, we've hired an ELA interventionist, a math interventionist at both Merit and the elementary. And as you know, you approved recently Ms. Sablaki Kohler sitting next to me to serve as our MTSS coordinator related to intervention as well. Previously, we had no shared digital collaboration. We've moved everything, all historical documents, as well as our new collaborative work to a Google Drive. So everyone who needs to access that can access that and update it regularly, and there's no sort of, I own this, and I'm not going to share it with other people. It's very, here are some resources. This is what I'm using in my classroom. So you can reach out and ask questions if needed. Uh, we are also working to balance the voices more. Historically, we had some teachers who were very experienced and um, well, versed in their fields and they tended to speak a lot at those TLC meetings and some of what they had was very important but it kind of marginalized some of the other folks uh, if they were newer teachers or if they weren't as strong personalities their voices weren't being heard and they weren't being respected so through our adaptive schools training we've developed ways to make sure all of those stakeholders on that committee have a voice in what's happening uh, there were less opportunities for teacher leadership. My predecessor did a wonderful job, but it was um, the feedback I've received that it was kind of, uh, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing that. And we've grown more to, is this going to work for you? How can we do this better? What feedback might you have to improve that process? And then finally, probably the key change here is instead of focusing on, well, we taught that, or what are we teaching, we're focused now on how did we teach it and how did the students learn? Or if they didn't, then what do we need to do to improve our own practice? So part of our strategic plan uh, that was developed by a large collaborative of board members, administrators, teachers, parents, students, community members, alumni, former teachers uh, last spring was creating a new district vision and a new district mission. 
Um, the district vision, of course, is engage, educate, and em empower tomorrow's global citizens. Um, our district mission is Brandywine Community Schools empowers critical thinkers, collaborators, and leaders through high expectations in an inclusive en environment. Um, I think this really speaks well to the chef versus the cook. Uh, it, it is not our job to prepare students for something. It is our job to prepare students for anything. Um, those, those critical thinking skills, those collaborator skills, those are 21st century skills that students will need to be successful um, in, in our society. So as part of our work as the Teaching and Learning Council, if we are going to empower our students to be these global citizens, if we're going to empower critical thinkers, collaborators, and leaders, um, we first need to empower and grow our teachers, not because they're not knowledgeable, not because they're not skilled, not because they're not well-equipped, not because they are not good enough, but because they can be even better. Um, as a collaborative group, we are focused on a growth mindset um, that, we are, that is all geared towards lifelong learning, continuing to increase our skill set each day so that we can better prepare our students for anything. As part of the strategic plan, academics and program section, um, our goal statement is provide relevant and viable opportunities to meet the academic needs of individual students to promote success. The first year objectives, which I'm just going to touch on, uh, uh, this is more Ms. Lazat's portion to speak in detail, but I will share with you, is initiate work on SAGE documents in all subjects and classes, develop a strategy for district-wide collaboration, and establish a process to systematically review instruction utilizing PLCs. Again, um, Ms. Lazat Lazat's going to go into more time, so I'm not going to cover that, but who drives this work? Uh, first, it starts with, with me, with the superintendent. I, I have to have the competence, the confidence, and probably most importantly, the capacity to be the instructional leader for the district. Um, it, it is the work of our director of state and federal programs, curriculum director, McKinney Vento, this, that, everything. Um, she is, you know, she is not the jack of all trades and master of none. She is the jack of all trades and master of most. Um, so I, I, maybe all, maybe all, we'll see. Um, it, we, have, we have extraordinary principals that are well-versed in, in what they do as instructional leaders. We now have the support of an MTSS coordinator driving this work. Um, the Teaching and Learning Council is made up of administrators, department chairs, grade level chairs, our IT team, our interventionist, our MTSS coordinator. It is a collaborative group work. Um, we have our intervention team driving this work. We have our teachers driving the work. Our paras drive the work, our aides. In summation, every single one of us um, is, is driving this part of the strategic plan. So specifically related to the Teaching and Learning Council, I have to say I'm incredibly amazed with these folks because we meet four times a year for one hour each time. And we have, so I've had eight meetings with this group total since I came to Brandywine. And we have made some, in my opinion, phenomenal progress. So I really have to give a shout out to that team. They, they're amazing. Um, it's obviously, I facilitate that committee, but many other administrators, all of our other administrators are on that as well. So they sometimes act as facilitators for their small groups if it's a discussion based on a practice that's happening in their building or developing a policy or a procedure uh, related to what's happening in their building. In terms of the discussion items that we focused on just this year alone, we've talked about our My KIPP goals, which I'll go into what that means in a moment. We focused on math and reading intervention, what programs we're using, what processes are in place to help identify students. We've developed a process called um, SAGE alignment for our curriculum documents. We've developed systems of collaboration. We've discussed professional learning opportunities and the direction that we think our district um, could benefit from heading and what training they need in order to get there. We've talked about, you may have heard of chat GTP and artificial intelligence. That's been a hot button issue. So we focused a little bit on how does that impact classroom instruction? What strategies or techniques might we need to use as a district to navigate that challenge? And then impact on our classroom practices as well as homework 
policies or practices in the handbooks, and then new curriculum and uh, review process that we developed this year. So for eight meetings, eight hours worth of work, there was some you know, work outside of the meetings as well, but uh, I feel very proud of what it is we've accomplished. And in order, I believe, I've always been a firm believer in continuous improvement, and you don't get better unless you're vulnerable enough to take feedback and to take advice. So I've implemented a process where I do survey members at the end of the year to say what worked well for you, what topics would you like on next year's agenda, are you willing to lead any of these conversations so that we can also then empower other educators, and it's not just uh, my voice in that. So we do follow the county calendar for curriculum review and adoption. Uh, with COVID, that got a little thrown off, not just with Brandywine, but with our entire county, and probably our entire country. Um, but we are working to align ourselves as closely as possible to that as we recover from COVID. So outlined in detail here is our curriculum review and adoption process. The main difference, as I said, we still follow the county calendar. Um, previously, there was 12 page document that if someone wanted to adopt new curriculum they went through the department chair or the grade level chair and filled out this fill in the blank thing that was created um, with yes no questions and i didn't really feel that it was very thorough or very comprehensive so we made some changes to that um, previously department chairs stood up in front of the council as i mentioned or grade level chairs and presented what it was they wanted to adopt and someone without any background in that specific content area might make a decision or have a vote on whether or not they should get those new materials we changed that as well um, there was no minimum of other resources that they needed to view. So we've instituted a minimum of at least three other uh, sets of textbooks or materials so that we're getting a decent comparison and not just, well, this district down the road chose this one, so my friend says it's good, so now we're going to do this one. No. Um, and then finally, it, it's remained the same that if we are, I believe board policy says, if we're adopting a curriculum that's over $25,000, then of course we need to bring that to the board and you need to have input on that as well. Of course, we would do that if it was under that, but I'm just saying that to my knowledge, that's what the board policy says. Uh, new changes that have happened in our new curriculum review and adoption process. Um, we have a rubric instead of that 12-page document. The rubric is a few pages long, and we are rating the curriculum or the materials that we read based on does it meet the needs or the criteria within our district. We used a model from the Nevada Department of Education as our starting point, but then we also added things that we felt were important in Brandywine too. So does it, does it connect with our technology systems that we have in place? Is there an intervention component? Are there online resources available for teachers? Are there, say if it's a math curriculum, manipulatives and blocks that students can use? So we've tailored that a little bit to our own needs as well. And um, part of the process that I instituted was that uh, teachers need to review how their current materials may show gaps. So before we go and do a big deep dive and adopt new material, first we need to prove that what we have is not working. Um, if it is working, then we want to be good stewards of the district's funds and not randomly go out and purchase new things. So um, just like you would do a needs assessment for school improvement or continuous improvement, we need to do that for our curriculum and materials as well. And we also, um, when available, Barry and Risa has a math consultant and an ELA consultant, as well as reading interventionists. So if we are looking at changes to our math program or our ELA reading programs, we bring them in and they consult with us and provide expert advice and guidance as well. All right, moving on to uh, MyKIP. MyKIP stands for the Michigan Integrated Continuous Improvement Process. This is school improvement for every district in the state of Michigan. This is what they all have to do, which is to develop a MyKIP plan. Um, before, if you've been around in school improvement for a while, it was PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. This is now my KIP, and it's a shift in three different things. So it's a focus on continuous improvement. 
Previously, it was each building sets a goal for one year, and at the end, you write this plan, and you put it in a binder, and you put it on a shelf, and at the end of the year, you pull the binder out, and you say, did we make the goal or did we not make the goal? Uh, the state wanted to get away from that because it wasn't based on implementation science, and it wasn't really driving true change in our school. So now we have, like I said, my KIPP, which is a continuous process. We set a five-year goal as a district, and that would be our end target, and then we set benchmark or interim targets along the way. The goal is a district goal, and our district goal is K-12 MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support for both academics and behavior. So that means how are we supporting our students at tier one with our general classroom instruction for those students who also need some intervention? How are we supporting them at that second level? And then finally, the students who still have a need, how do we support them um, at that third level? Another shift with my KIPP is a shift to whole child thinking. So not only is it important for schools to support the academic education of children, but as you know, after the pandemic, the whole country saw increased mental health needs among our students as well. So um, schools are encouraged to look at how are we providing support and services for student mental health needs, as well as mental health and well-being of staff, because we know if we don't have well-regulated, secure, um, confident staff in front of students, that trickles down into how they deliver instruction. And then finally, a shift to systems thinking. So focusing on what systems can be put in place throughout our district to improve instruction. So we did a needs assessment. As anyone who's familiar with continuous improvement knows, you start by looking at what are we currently doing well and where are the gaps or how do we need to improve? We did that and what we discovered <laughs> was that we needed a more formal, collaborative, and balanced discussions related to our instruction and student engagement. We learned that we needed a formalized systems-based approach to analyzing student data. So we did a decent job, in my opinion, of testing our students and looking at some of the data, but we weren't across the board using it to drive our instruction and to um, improve in a uniform, universal way. So we found that that was a need as well. We also needed support for the whole child. Following the pandemic, we had students come back who were dealing with increased levels of anxiety and depression, which prevented them from being able to engage in the normal classroom functions. So what were we going to do about that? We also discovered we needed what's called a guaranteed and viable curriculum with more rigorous instruction utilizing research-based practices. So no matter what student ends up in what class with what teacher, they have access to quality instructional materials. That's a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And then we needed to close those learning gaps that we saw after the pandemic and to accelerate learning. After we assessed our needs, then we had to develop a plan. I talked a little bit about that plan. You heard about our Teaching and Learning Council. An additional component of that was getting stakeholder feedback. So not only did we get feedback from the Teaching and Learning Council and from our teachers, but we also gave a survey um, that was up on the website when we talked about our ESSER funds and how should we use those funds as a district. Uh, parents, community members, staff, even students had the opportunity to weigh in on how they thought those funds should be used. And then we had a strategic planning workshop, which some of you uh, pr were present for, with the previous school board, as well as many administrators, parents, even some students and teachers, where they provided feedback to. We discovered then that we should implement adaptive schools. We created the role of the MTSS coordinator to help further some of those systems. We added a K-12 social worker last year, which I was very proud about. And I can tell you, not every district in the state, certainly not every district in this county either, has a dedicated social worker K-12. So that's been a wonderful addition to our staff, I believe. 
We also used to share an elementary counselor between Merritt and the elementary, and we used our ESSER funds to create a, an additional counselor position, so each building has a designated counselor. They are no longer having to split their time and travel between buildings. They like that one. <laughs> and we begin the process of the SAGE document, which um, Emily will talk to you a little bit more about in a moment. I already said our district goal is those K-12 systems for academics and behavior. Each building also devised its own goal related to that overarching goal. The high school chose with their building leadership team and the principal to focus on engagement, student engagement, and as well as accountability of both students and staff. The elementary chose last year to focus on tier one math instruction. And then Merritt focused on tier one ELA instruction as well as PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavior Implementation Supports. So the third step with MyKIP is implement. How are we implementing this? I've already talked about several ways. Another one that I'd like to draw attention to is win time or what I need now. If you have children in the district, you may have heard them come home and say, we do this in win time or I go to this area in win time. So that's a dedicated intervention or extension period uh, based on a standard. If a student has mastered that standard, then they're provided with extensions to deepen their learning. And if a student is struggling to meet that standard, then they're provided with small group instruction uh, to go ahead and help them be able to master that standard. Uh, the elementary and merit also have collaborative team meetings or PLC meetings, professional learning communities, where they're looking at student data twice a month and that gives them a more regular pulse on is their instruction truly getting the students where they need to be at what time. Let's see. Middle school, high school has implemented an ELA and math foundations classes. Again, those are for students who need additional support in meeting those standards in math and ELA. And the middle school, high school has also adopted CAT time, two times per week. CAT stands for core academic time. So this is where students can sign up to go and work with a certain teacher um, to make up a test, to have a concept explained to them that they did not understand the first time. And teachers, to my knowledge, can also request to work with specific students during that time. Step four of the MyKit process is monitoring. So how do we monitor this? Well, we use research-based fidelity tools to monitor this, and this comes from the NERN Institute, or National Implementation Research Network. That's out of Chapel Hill University, North Carolina. So we're looking at things like the TFI, or the Tier Fidelity Inventory. There's one for PBIS. There's also one for reading. We're looking at the MTSS practice profile, so how much progress have we made implementing certain factors under that practice profile? And that's really what drives Emily's work, is looking at where are we as a district, where do we need to be to get to that 80% rate um, where our students are receiving the services they need. And then the last step of the MyKit process is evaluation. Now, because this is a five-year goal, and I came on board, as did Mr. Walker, two years ago, we're in year two of the five-year goal. So we are not evaluating an end target yet, but we're evaluating those interim targets. And I'm happy to report that in terms of the practice profile for MTSS, we made significant progress this year even though Ms. Sablocki Kohler didn't get to fully assume her role until about a month ago. Um, we were at a 70% implementation rate for our first two factors in that, so that was reassuring that we're moving in the right direction. Um, I also am within the MyKit platform monitoring this all the time, setting goals for ourselves. Did, like, for example, we wanted all of our staff to be trained in adaptive schools so that we could have collaborative conversations in a way that really improved learning. And we have implemented that this year. So again, we set those interim targets with the goal of full-on K-12 MTSS systems for behavior and academics um, after five years. 
And when we tie all of this back, the MyKIP goal, the strategic plan, and we look at those academics and programs areas as our focus, um, one of the things that came out of that was the need for curriculum alignment, K-12. So we developed a process loosely based on what the elementary did in the Hill project, which was for ELA. And this is what I coined the SAGE process. So SAGE stands for Standards, Assessments, Guided Interventions, and Extensions. This also aligns with something called the PLC model, Professional Learning Communities, and that's centered around four questions. So standards align with the question, what do we want our students to know and be able to do? And all of our standards, when applicable, come from the Michigan Department of Education. Sometimes, like for example, STEM or art, that we may get those from a national organization if Michigan doesn't have specific standards. The second one, assessments. How do we know when our students know it? That's how we reflect that in the assessments. Could be projects, not just traditional tests. Guided interventions. What do we do as teachers when they don't know it? Gone are the days of, sorry kid, I taught it, you didn't learn it. <laughs> as teachers, we have to be reflective and say, okay, so I taught it that way and they didn't learn it this way. What's another way I can teach it? Or why didn't they learn it? That's part of the PLC process with guided interventions, and then finally extensions. Some students master concepts quicker than other students or may do really well in ELA, but struggle in math. We can't prescribe the same instruction for every kid. As Mr. Walker alluded to earlier, every student is unique, they have unique needs. We need to know what can we do when they've mastered that? How do we extend or deepen their learning to keep them engaged and to keep them moving forward? Within the SAGE process, um, one of the funny ways to explain this, a guaranteed and viable curriculum, and one of the things that Mr. Boger refers to often is the idea that we don't want children who have a Swiss cheese experience. So where they come through our classrooms or they come through our schools and they are missing pieces here and there, depending on what their experience was or who they had or what materials we had at that year or didn't have that year. So we want that guaranteed and viable curriculum for all students. Any student should be able to be successful in a classroom which is not dependent on the instructor that they have. So the materials that they have should be sufficient enough that they are getting that guaranteed and viable curriculum at tier one. We wanna make sure that the materials we select work with the power standards or the essential standards that we've already identified as teachers, um, again, related to the Michigan Department of Education. We want to make sure, too, with the SAGE process that new teachers, we hired, I believe, 20 new teachers last year. Um, as a new teacher, to walk into a district and there is nothing laid out for you, that can be incredibly daunting and overwhelming, and that does not set you up for success. So the SAGE process is supposed to have a system in place that when we hire a new staff, they can hit the ground running, they know what's expected, they know how to be a collaborative part of the team, and they can make sure that their students are getting that guaranteed and viable learning experience. Also, it helps we might have some teachers that shift from one building to another, or maybe they taught social studies, but then they go to the English department because they're certified in that. So if you're transferring grade levels or content areas, again, that gives you a framework to be able to hit the ground running. It ensures horizontal alignment, so all fourth grade team has identified what they want to focus on, what are their priorities. Each kid in each fourth grade class will get that same information. And then finally, it leads to a better understanding and a learning progression, K-12. We call this vertical alignment. So if I'm teaching a persuasive essay in fourth grade, but I didn't teach one based on informational text, we want to make sure that fifth grade is teaching that next essay based on informational text so we don't end up with those gaps where we keep hitting the same concept over again and we forget to include other important standards. And now I'm happy to say that I am done and I'm gonna pass the mic to Ms. Blocky Kohler so that she can talk and actually show you an example of one of these SAGE documents that everyone has had to complete and fortunately been pretty nice and willing when I've asked them to do that. 
So we thought that maybe if you saw an actual example, it might kind of help explain the process a little. So I teach a bunch of subjects, or I taught, but biology was one of them. And now that I'm leaving, our new teacher will have these available to her or him um, so they can use them. Uh, in the first quarter, um, week five, our priority standard was HSLS 1.6 about biomolecules and how they're made, which is how life is made. So if we don't understand that early on, we're in a lot of trouble throughout the year. Um, so that's our what, right? That's the standard that we need to meet. The why is then what students should be able to do based on that standard. And then we'll continue to carry those ideas through throughout the rest of the year as we build about what life is and how life works. Um, the vocabulary are things that they'll hear over and over and over again. Um, the list could be really, really, really long, but we try and keep it to those really important keywords. Um, the how are the things that we're going to do in class to do those things. Um, so it could be discussions, it could be model building, it could be a lab, um, and any of those things could go there. Those are also things that like change from year to year, right? Depending on the group of students you have, what they're interested in things along those lines. Um, for this particular standard, it fell below the line, but the assessment was they had to create superheroes for their four biomolecules and relate the traits of the biomolecules to their superheroes. So we had like protein man and carbo man who is really strong and things like that. Um, and then students who kind of struggle with those biomolecules that we know are going to be built throughout the year, um, then we would do some kind of pull aside groups with them, or I would, um, looking at making charts of what those biomolecules are, maybe laying them out in a different way so that they can better understand those. And then um, the extension would be that uh, they do a murder mystery meal, so they get this like sludge of biomolecules and they have to um, figure out what biomolecules the people have eaten to figure out who got murdered. And they've done previous experiments like this, but they haven't had the like combo where they have to figure it out. So the kids that really get it get to kind of go a little bit further. And so that's kind of how our SAGE documents work. Um, and so then when we look at MTSS. Excuse me, just for a second. I don't think we had that previous was, slide in our presentation. Yeah, it was, it's in the board notes. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It was not there. We added it today. Okay. Because we thought an example might be helpful. <laughs> slide. Yes. No, that's but we can get it to you. Thank you. Hit me you up. Thank you. No problem. Um, and so then Ms. Lazat started talking about MTSS, and this is kind of the first year that we've really kind of hit it really hard and focused on it as a key point. Um, MTSS has two sides, as she mentioned, the academic side and the behavioral side. Um, the bottom is what we call our tier one instruction, that's universal. So those are the things that are happening in our classrooms every day. Those are the things that are listed on our SAGE documents that each teacher would use. Um, it's the large group instruction and even some of the smaller groups that we pull out within our classrooms to work with students. Um, tier two and tier three are more based on our data driven, driven instruction and our progress monitoring. Um, tier two is more targeted smaller groups, seven, eight kids, um, varying groups from t uh, group to group, and we'll talk about those. And then tier three are intensive support, so one or two students working together on a concept that they really, really struggle with. Uh, this year we worked really hard on our academic supports as we brought in our interventionist and myself, and we started our intervention team. Um, next year we're already planning to bring in our behavioral piece because we know that that's so important and we feel like we have a pretty good foothold on academic supports with lots of room to grow still obviously, but we have a basis and we're ready to kind of bring in those behavioral supports. So MTSS, if it was defined, is the ongoing progress through which we can make data-driven decisions to help students learn universally and is used to provide additional supports to meet the needs of all learners. We want every kid to learn. Wherever they're at, we want to meet them there and we want to take them further. Um, and so if that means we need to provide extra supports for students, we want to do that. If you need extra supports because you already get it, we want to provide you those as well. And if you just need a little help to catch on to what we're doing, we want that too. So MTSS works to help every kid make improvements, but from where that student is at. So 
the bar changes depending on the student. We measure growth depending on each individual student, and we go from there. Um, we brought into play this year um, some universal screeners and progress monitoring that we did with greater fidelity than we had in the past. Um, all of the buildings took NWEA, which is a nationally normed test. We focus on the math, the reading, and the science pieces of that. Um, there's also a language usage piece, um, but we chose not to make that kind of one of our big focuses. Uh, we introduced the Delta Math um, intervention strategies. Um, the middle school had been doing that and had had a bunch of success and were happy with it, so we thought we should bring it everywhere else and we can kind of see how that fits. Um, Dibbles is used to test early liter literacy in uh, the K to sixth grades. Um, and then uh, at Merritt, they use Orton Gillingham uh, for additional literacy needs, depending on kind of where students fall. You can click us on. Um, each building works a little bit differently. Um, there's different ages of kids, the groups work differently, the staff makeups are different, so everyone's kind of found their own niche as we do things, and while there's a lot of similarities, there's obviously um, variety between those. Um, so for interventions at Merit, they use their win time, so they have a math win time and an ELA win time um, every day, or Monday through Thursday. Um, in math, they use the delta, so they take a screener in the fall and it says which standards kids have mastered from the previous year's grade, so a second grader would get tested on first grade standards, um, and then we know where kids are behind, because if you can't do first grade math, second grade math is really hard. Um, and we regroup on those. Those work in eight day cycles, so about every two weeks they regroup their groups based on where the kids fall in the mastery of the standard. Um, ELA uses a variety of things because at Merit, the, there's so much variation in student skills. Um, so they bring in a lot of different groups, and those groups are a lot more flexible. Um, and so maybe a student's in my group today to work on phonics, but tomorrow he's in Ms. Lazat's group to work on something else, if, that, if he's kind of mastered that. Um, and then the title staff pulls out students that need Tier 2 and Tier 3 instruction for additional supports. Um, and those groups kind of shift every couple weeks, especially for math, and ELA is even more flexible. At the elementary, um, they also use the Delta Math for their win time, so those work pretty much the same in those eight-day groups. Um, at the elementary, the title staff makes sure to pull the students that have the highest needs. Um, so those that have the largest deficits. Um, and then ELA is once again dependent upon what needs the students have, and those groups are set up that way. Um, and then the title staff provides uh, more intensive tier three intervention. Um, it kind of seems that those kids that are uh, in greater need of tier three become more evident once they start to gain those reading skills. So those become more evident and more needed once we, the kids get to the elementary. Um, as they've learned to read and started to do math. Um, the middle school has a foundations class that's offered in um, English language arts and then also in math. Those are students that fall in the bottom 30% on NWEA test. They take a semester class. Um, they could be in it both semesters. They could be in it one semester. They could be in it in seventh and eighth grade. Um, but the hope is to catch them up on those skills that they're lacking or not as strong in. Um, and then we also use cat time as a way to pull kids specifically for math and language that maybe don't fall on that bottom 30%, but could use some additional supports. Or you need math foundation, so we'll put you in a cat time group for ELA so you can kind of get caught up there. Um, and we just base those every semester. Um, we're looking to make some changes to how the middle school and high school um, provide interventions next year, but because there's so many classes and so many kids and so much fluidity, um, it's not quite as simple to figure out win time and be able to pull groups. Um, and the high school works very similar to the middle school, except uh, we don't have a foundations class in the high school, so kids are just um, provided those intervention strategies during cat time, which is twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays for about 25 minutes. Um, and they still use those same benchmarks, NWEA and Delta.
What questions might you or others be holding on to? How much autonomy do you give the faculty to insert supplemental material at, at their discretion, or is there any room for that uh, on top of the established curriculum? You said autonomy of the staff to add supplemental yeah. material? Yeah, yep. It, whatever they're doing, just like we talked about with the um, alignment, horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, we hope that if, if one teacher is doing it at a grade level that the others are doing it because we don't want that Swiss cheese. We, we want students getting the same experience. Um, but certainly they, they have autonomy to um, add things to the curriculum that uh, through their assessment of the student learning, of meeting the student where they're at, to, to add as they see needed uh, to make an impact to help grow that student. Um, so just so I'm clear, going back to um, kind of like the original um, slide where you put the very basic elements of what a curriculum is per Merriam-Webster, um, so would it, it, would it be safe to say that um, the highest, most broad t tier of it would be the state standards or um, general standards provided for the districts to follow? Um, this is the minimum of what we require the students to learn at each grade level in each subject, right? And then would it be safe to say that, I believe you said there was a rubric developed, but um, I guess my assumption of that would be that that would be the curriculum for lack of a better word like a more specific um, mapping of the standards would be like the next tier of learning and then subsequent from that would be like teaching plans or implementation within the classroom was that a safe generalization Yes, I think you hit the nail on the head with the first one in that the most general guidance is those state standards or national standards where we don't have state standards. Sure. Um, the second part with the rubric, that rubric is when we're adopting new material. So we're looking at textbooks, does this meet our needs, is there a technology component, whatever. So that rubric is separate. But then I think you, maybe were you talking about the SAGE piece and then below that would be the actual teacher less, daily lesson plans. Okay, so the SAGE piece would map more towards a, like a district curriculum. Abs like, yes, okay. the various components of that district-wide curriculum, yes. Okay. So then going off of the SAGE piece then, um, I, I understood that that was the means to ensure a guaranteed and viable curriculum across the board for all students. Um, can you tell me again when that was implemented? So in terms of the SAGE documents itself, that was at the beginning of this school year. Um, the elementary school had worked through this process with ELA right. when they received a grant from Western Michigan University and they had a facilitator from the college come out and help them with that. Okay. And we learned last year, which was my first year, that that was a pretty decent protocol to start outlining some of this stuff. So we went ahead and implemented that district-wide at the beginning of this school year. Okay, and then um, I think that was it on that. And then with respect to the um, horizontal and subject alignment and the vertical alignment, um, that's encompassed in the SAGE process for each grade, correct? That's correct. So the elementary in general, or K, DK through six, they work in their grade level specific teams. Okay. So when they're making these SAGE documents, if there are four second grade teachers, they're all sitting at the table and they're all looking at, okay, we have this textbook, we're using chapter three, lesson four to teach this standard, and then we're gonna give this assessment that we've either pulled from the textbook or developed together, and then we're gonna talk about that student data. Okay. So yes, um, it gets a little bit different in the middle school, high school, because some teachers, like for example, we only had one honors biology class, so she was kind of it for honors biology. Okay. But if there are multiple, like US history, we have a couple teachers who teach that, or algebra two, we have a couple teachers who teach that, so they have to collaborate and work together on that document so that they are all on the same page and every student has that same experience. So one more question with respect to SAGE. So since SAGE was just um, starting to get implemented this year, yep. 
how are we addressing the Swiss cheese students from previous years? Because they're all over. That's correct. Potentially. Yes, and so that's the intervention piece. So they are getting the benchmark screener, which is the NWEA fall, winter, spring in reading, math, and science. They don't offer a social studies NWEA, so just those three areas. When they are below that 30th percentile, then we're doing further diagnostic screeners to say, okay, maybe you need some additional help in phonemic awareness, or maybe you don't know how to divide fractions, or so we're then diagnosing, like, what is the standard that they're missing, and then that gets addressed during their win time, their what I need now time, or in the middle school, high school, during that foundations period. So is there a focus on getting our high schoolers that are about to graduate? Is that, is that the priority, getting them ready for what they're potentially going to be in college? Or do we have enough resources across the board to meet every student at every grade level? Because, I mean, it could potentially be a lot. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is a lot, and it's a lot right now, having started with the elementary and moving our way up to middle school, high school. Um, with our 10th grade students, many of them have already kind of had to choose a career pathway or college readiness pathway. And so some of them are out of the building and they're in the CTE programs and they're in their trades. And so we don't have as much time to make up those skill deficits. And that's something that I think became apparent to many districts after the pandemic um, was that, hey, we have to go back and address some of these fundamental things. So at this point in time, they're getting that cat time where they can check in with their teachers two days a week or the teachers can request them two days a week, but we don't have that formal win time up in middle so school. So if high parents school. are recognizing that they're, you know, their students struggling with their transition into their career mm -hmm. um, program, then the, the only resource they have is the cat time at this point? For academics, um, we do have guidance counselors as well in the middle school, high school, so if it's like a, a life choice thing or which, you know, am I going career college readiness or which pathway am I going, and then we have the social worker as well to navigate that. But we do have at least that, that they can reach out if they need some additional support. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I want to go back to the first question, too, about most general. I know we're starting very, very general, very broad and, and narrowing that down, but here's the discrepancy in, in why you hear so many different um, theories on what curriculum is, because I would not say it is the standards. Uh, I would say that it is the standards plus how we teach, because how we teach is so imperative to that curriculum piece. So um, that's where I start, is maybe standards plus how we teach. You know, like I said, that simplified definition, what and how. So I just kind of want to, you know, reemphasize, I mean, there, you can talk with the 10 members are administrative team, and I think you're gonna get 10 different answers on what curriculum is. Um, but, but, you know, I hold it as more largely how we teach is, is the impact on kids. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You. Well done. All right, we're gonna... We're going to take a five minute recess and we'll turn in five minutes. I mean, we'll come back in five minutes.
Yeah, I just all of a sudden yeah, really like started. Sweating. I've been cold the entire time. And it's getting lucky now. A week. <laughs> Making sure we have all the things. Hey, what's up? Come and say hi. Hey. No, no, I was rushing back here from the track meet. I'm not done. How did, how did they do? I'm glad we got comfy so, chairs. Uh, yeah, I'm glad know, we got right? comfy chairs. Well, the relay really came in last, which is whatever. Mm -hmm. You made it. Please start returning to your seats. We're going to start in two seconds. One, call to order. Recess is over. Call to order. Please be seated. Next discussion item is the resignation of Mr. Moray. Um, first, I want to comment. Certainly thank you for his service, for two years of service, I believe, or about two years. Him and his wife are, are moving to Hastings. I think they're both teachers, is that correct? They are both teachers, yeah. yes. So, greatly appreciate the service. Yeah, Mr. Morey is, is going to be a, uh, he's going to be a big loss. Um, he is department chair, uh, teaches some of our high, higher level math, has in, been involved in multiple coaching ro roles, and uh, we are certainly going to miss Mr. Morey. Next up is the appointment of second grade teacher. It's a discussion item. Any questions or comments? Okay, the chair, we move to the action item. Chair recommends that we approve the uh, appointment of Caitlin Littrup for the second, K second grade teacher. Make that motion. I'll support. Any questions or discussions? Just one question, is that beginning this year? Yes. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of approving the appointment of Caitlin 
Liltrup, I think I said that right? Lil Pop. Lil Pop, thank you. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion's carried. Congratulations. All right, next up is administrative con contracts. Mr. Walker. Yeah, as I said in the board notes, the, uh, the board has received a copy of one of the administrator contracts aside from uh, salary and days and of course their position title. Um, all contracts are the same, so that is just something that this time of year we, we share with the board um, so that you can view those contracts. Any questions for Mr. Walker? Next on the agenda is the performance pay for teachers and administration. Mr. Walker. Uh, as I, sh again, shared in the board notes, um, this is something that we are going to look in to improving in the future, uh, but that's going to take some work. That's going to take some work and discussion uh, with the BDEA and with the administrative team. Um, it's something that we want to improve and uh, I think make more equitable across the board. Uh, but for now, we are, because of the time that that will take, that is a, I believe, a summer project. So for this year, we are just recommending that we move forward um, with the performance pay for teachers and administrators as presented uh, and, has, and as we have done in, in past years. I do have a question. So how many, I guess, qualified last year versus this year? Uh, I do not have that number. Okay. Move to the action item. Um, uh, chair recommends to approve the performance pay for teachers and administrators. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. I'll support. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the performance pay for teachers and administrators say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And motion. You got it. Motion is carried. Next up is the BDEA, BDEA letter of agreement. Mr. Walker. So this year we, um, have, we signed a letter of agreement with the BDEA uh, for the implementation of a sick bank. Um, with that implementation, it started second semester. Uh, at that time, we had teachers apply to the sick bank. Um, we had one. We had one teacher who, at the start of the year, had we started this, they they would have um, had some sick days available to them, and they did apply, not knowing that they had exhausted their sick days, their accumulated sick days. Um, they then uh, had a a uh, medical issue where they had to be hospitalized for a couple days, and uh, that left them with unpaid days, obviously, because they had exhausted all their sick days. So we had another teacher who had approached me and said that they would like to donate their days um, on behalf of this teacher. There, there's nowhere in the contract where it allows teachers to donate days, and that is not a precedent that I wanted to set. Uh, but I approached the BDEA and, and shared with them what was going on, and we came to an agreement that it would be fair for this teacher who wanted to don donate the days, and only because the teacher who had exhausted their days originally applied to be in the sick bank, um, that was not an after the fact of, oh, I need days, I'm going to apply. They originally applied to be in it. They just didn't have the days to join it, so they were going to have to join it next year. Um, they expressed the interest in it this year. We knew it was something they wanted to do. Uh, so what we did was we said if that teacher who was willing to donate the days on behalf of that teacher donated a day to the sick bank, we would consider that on behalf of the teacher who had exhausted their days. That teacher would then donate one regular day next year for for themselves, that would be their second year of donation, and they would cover the donation on behalf of the teacher that donated on their behalf this year. Both teachers would then fully be vested in the sick bank. Um, so we wrote that letter of agree agreement and are recommending that as presented. Thank you. Now we move on to the Berrien Risa Biennial. Uh, I'm sorry, action item. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, to approve the BDEA letter of agreement, is there a motion to do so? Make that motion. I'll support. Any 
comments or questions? All those in favor of approving the letter of agreement say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. Now we move on to the Baron Risa biannual election resolution. Um, we did read that resolution at the previous meeting. However, at the last the meeting in April, last meeting in April, uh, I asked for anybody or for anybody to submit their their uh, I guess interest in being a representative of the Brandywine. Community Schools Board of Education uh, for this task. Uh, is anyone interested before we move to nominations? I'll do it. I've done it okay. Past. All right. And we we do need a alternate. Um, so is is there anyone interested in alternate? If Miss Pomerinka cannot make it. So we do need to go through and approve the nominations of such. Anybody in else interested in being nominated? So we have a nomination of Ms. Pomerenka as being the primary representative and Ms. McKee as being the alternate. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Do it. There's a motion to vote. Okay. Uh, is it, was there a second? Was there a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. Congratulations and thank you. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it. Now we move on to the candidates, um, which is required that we um, recommend candidates. There's only three. <laughs> there's th three three uh, open positions and only three candidates that are running, and that's John Prose, uh, Jacqueline Van Horn, and Mr. Dave Pagel. Um, any questions or comments around that? Anybody objecting, um, supporting those as, as candidates and supporting the vote for them when Ms. Pomerica attends the recent meeting to vote on behalf of Brandywine Community Schools Board of Education? Support. Any dis any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion's carried. Now we move on to. Let me get there. Um, Uh, we do have to have a roll call vote, and I apologize. We do have to. So, if we could do a roll call vote, Ms. Seastrom. Um, yes. Mr. Payne. Yes. Mr. Birch. Yes. Mrs. Crouch. Yes. Mrs. McCombs. Yes. Uh, Mrs. McKee. Yes. Mrs. Pomeranka. Yes. And I say yes. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the edit of NEOLA policy 0151 uh, for the organizational meetings. Um, from what I understand, uh, all the other school districts or most school districts hold their elections of the officers in January. I think Brandywine is a little, uh, the only one or, or one of the very few that still holds it in, in July. I think it's appropriate that we do change it. And there's some other language that's in there that, um, in other words, I'm sorry, change it from July, which is obviously in a couple months, but change it to January, which aligns uh, with the election process that we have currently, uh, meaning the national and regional state election processes. Um, the other l language in there is either the superintendent or the ranking officer of the uh, preceding board 
uh, who shall serve as presiding officer until the election of a temporary chairperson who shall in turn serve until the election of president. Um, the, I'm sorry, the meeting shall be called to order by either the superintendent or the ranking officer. So we need to decide not only to move, but to, uh, to move the election from July to January, but also to provide on, uh, decide in the language that either the superintendent or the ranking officer will um, be responsible for calling that meeting for the election of officers. Any questions or discussion regarding that? So my, my recommendation would be on the second sentence, I guess, of that new policy, um, I would recommend that the meeting be called to order by the ranking officer. I think certainly it falls in line with probably most other school districts, but it does make sense. Um, and also I would recommend that we do move the election from July of this year to January of 2024. What, okay, question, what if we don't have a ranking officer that gets selected? Let's say like we have four in new incumbents, we don't have anybody who is on the three. Can, could super, does the superintendent then, can you start the meeting then? Um, it may make sense then to maybe change the language if in fact we don't have a ranking officer then we include the language, then the superintendent would be second in line to call the meeting. That does make sense. Mr. Walker, did you have a recommendation? I am good with whatever we do here. <laughs> I'm sorry, what he, he said? said he's, he's good with whatever, whatever we do. <laughs> okay. Did you get that, the recommended language? Yes, so okay. um, just to recap, the motion is to change the language such that the meeting is moved to January, or the organizational meeting is moved to January in line with the election process, and that um, primarily the ranking officer call to order, and secondarily, if no officer is available, the superintendent will call to order until a president is, or a presiding officer is appointed, president is appointed. Correct. Is that, is that correct, how you recommended it? Thank you. All right, the next action, I, any other questions? I'm sorry, I don't want to move on unless we're finished. Obviously, that will, this will be an action item um, at, the, at the next meeting in, in May. I'm sorry, at the next meeting in June. Um, So the second reading of the Neola policies, Mr. Walker, do you have any comments on that? I do not. Okay, so we have the second reading of the Neola policies. Everyone received a copy in their board packet. Uh, any questions on those or comments or suggestions? Then the, the chair recommends we approve the uh, board, you know, board policy spring update as presented. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. <coughs> motion carried. Then we had a dis discussion regarding um, um, policy number 5511, dress and grooming. And I think it was just recommended that we add language which uh, includes uh, letter C at the bottom of the policy, uh, direct staff to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory uniform manner. Um, so that's what was discussed. There was no additional um, language recommended. 
So the chair does recommend that we approve the language for policy number 5511, dress and grooming. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Is there a second? Support. Any discussion? Yes. Um, what was omitted from the language, Mr. Walker, that um, a community member had mentioned? So the optional language is direct staff to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory and uniform, uniform manner. Um, and, and that is what is on the agenda tonight. The rest of it reads, including without regard to whether a student is transgender or gender non-conforming. But let me add a comment. That was not part of the recommended language when it was proposed or uh, when we first did the initial reading of that. Um. So. So the, why was um, the remaining language omitted? It wasn't omitted. I recommended the language. We didn't omit any language. I rec recommended the language, meaning the direct staff to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory uniform manner. There was no language omitted. There was language that was recommended. That in I believe you said that that had to be followed regardless, right, in compliance, to be in compliance with the law. So the, the omission, for lack of a better word, of that specific demographic of students is still going to be enforced. With or without any of the language, um, it, they have to enforce the school's dress code in a non-discriminatory and uniform manner, including without regard to whether a student is transgender or gender non-conforming. So whether it has the last part, whether it has any of it, that, that's required. It, it's uniform regardless of whatever. Yes. So. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, Chair recommends, do we have a motion and second uh, to do that? I, Not yet. I moved and um, you and Mrs. Second. McKee supported. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of approving the NEOLA policy 5511 dressing grooming say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. Hear I'm sorry. Let's, if we could hear everyone, that'd be great. Aye. <laughs> all right, let's try this again. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Okay, motion carried. Thank you. What was the count? Six and one. Okay, second reading of NEOLA policy 5230, late arrival and early dismissal. And the only thing I think we added and discussed last meeting was to add or guardian. And is that correct, Mr. Walker? I yes, think we had on the, on the third paragraph just, of the student's parent or guardian. Any questions regarding that? Well, Chair recommends we approve that language. Is there a motion to do so? A motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. <coughs> All right, next up is the discussion item. Mr. Walker, can you kind of just give us a debrief on that, please? So each year the board uh, needs to approve um, our non-homestead operating tax levy, our sinking fund tax levy, and then our debt service tax levy. Uh, the non-homestead operating tax levy is currently set at 18 mils. The voter approved sinking fund tax levy is one mil, and our current debt service tax levy is 4.0 mils. Uh, as Mr. Knoll said this evening in his presentation, um, we have seen a increase in our property taxable value um, up to, I, he said 8%, I, I believe our number was 7.4, Mr. Wilburn, are you nodding? Yeah, 7.4%. Um, so what that does is that generates more revenue on, on our debt levy, um, and, all, but in, and the only way it does that, because the property values have gone up, we get more revenue, 
but that's at the cost of the taxpayers. So we're actually recommending taking that tax levy down to 3.9 mills. Um, that will save our taxpayers a little bit of money and we'll still generate the same revenue to pay off that debt service. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping, as I discussed at the April meeting, um, that in May of 2024, uh, we would be going for a zero mill increase again with increased property taxes we don't need um, the four mills and and it's not much but we want to save our taxpayers what we can right now any questions comments all right uh, chair recommends that we approve the l4029 tax millage tax millage rate uh, is there a motion to so approve moved. the rate? Second? Is there a second? second? Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The L4. Oh, it does need a roll call vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Payne? Yes. Mr. Birch? Yes. Mrs. Crouch? Yes. Ms. McCombs? Yes. Ms. M Mrs. McKee? Yes. Mrs. Pomerenko? Yes. And I vote yes as well. All right, last meeting we discussed the out of state tuition rate. I think everyone was in agreement um, to move forward with that uh, but certainly uh, want to give anybody an opportunity to ask any questions or make any comments so if not let's move to the action item um, is there a motion to approve approve the 2324 out of state tuition rate make that motion support so we do have a motion in the second. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion's carried. Mr. Walker, student handbook, please. Um, so tonight we just have the discussion item for our student handbooks. Uh, those have been, those changes have been shared with you, uh, but if the principals would quickly highlight uh, any of the uh, major changes that are going on. In, in fact, Mr. Severin really is just changing dates and names. So uh, unless there is something that you want to add to the conversation, I, I don't think that we need to discuss the merit handbook. Mr. Boger, I know you didn't have a lot of changes, but you did have, you're, you are taking out your matrix, correct? Do you want to speak about that or would you like me to? Thank you. So within the elementary handbook, there are tiered levels of discipline. And within those tiers, it describes what the options are that either a teacher or that I can give as a discipline for a student. Uh, when I moved to the elementary, I came from here where there was a matrix that I did not write. But when I moved to the elementary, there was no matrix. So because I've been doing it for so long, I had to have something just as a guideline for me because I can follow our, our handbook and make decisions based on the child's age because I'm dealing with a whole different age level now. And third graders have different behaviors than sixth graders. And you, you, when you have a matrix, that's, uh, it's not black and white, although some people want it to be black and white. And so it was put into the handbook uh, because of... It was a secret, and it certainly wasn't, and anybody could look at it. It's just I'm the one that makes those, those decisions. I'm the one that gives the kids ultimately the, the bigger uh, disciplines. Teachers can still give them take recess and do uh, detentions and things like that. But uh, so it, it did not need to be in the handbook. In fact, it's recommended by lawyers that it's not in the handbook. So we've removed that. I'll still use the same matrix, uh, basically, to, to follow so that I'm consistent with, with what I do. Any questions about that? Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Boger, officially. Mr. Winkler for middle school, high school handbook. Did you have anything you wanted to discuss? No? Okay. Just names and, and uh, dates, correct? Okay. So very simple changes there. And Ms. Sorensen? Okay. Same thing. Names, names and dates. Not, uh, not a lot of changes. Thank you. Next, we move on to the football tri triple midline toss camp. Um, anybody, Mr. Walker, do you want to explain that? Or sure? Yeah, Coach Kinsey is here, and he'll speak briefly about the overnight camp. This uh, for them for them to do the overnight trip. This uh, needs to be approved. Excuse me, by the board per policy. There we go. All right, so um, first of all, uh, I know I know most of you guys, some of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Justin Kinsey. I am a math teacher here at the junior senior high school. Uh, I am also the freshman head basketball coach, middle school track coach, and I'm here today as the uh, head varsity football coach. Uh, about a year ago, I had the privilege of uh, being voted on by some of you guys. Mr. Walker, I know I met with you on multiple occasions to discuss my plans for the football program. Uh, this camp is one of those components. Um, I know I made a couple of promises to the community and to the people on the hiring committee. Uh, one of them was to bring youth football back, which we have. We have Pop Warner back in our community now, and surprisingly, we're gonna be able to field three full football and cheerleading teams. Uh, I made a promise that you guys would have to buy me more helmets. Numbers are up with every other football program in our area down, schools dropping to eight man. We're looking to have somewhere between 35 to 40 football players, which is 10% of our student population, math teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so this camp is part of just trying to create a culture, a little bit of pride in uh, Brandywine football, obviously. We love our sports here at Brandywine. Um, and having a team camp is a big part of that. This specific camp uh, is hosted in Indiana. We happen to have two national well-recognized programs just within you know an hour of us uh, at Mishawaka and Warsaw. They host this camp at Manchester University. It's an overnight camp. It's just a great opportunity for our guys to learn a little bit about football, but the majority of this is creating that brotherhood and um, letting everybody on the team kind of bond to get to know each other. And uh, you know, everybody knows the movie, Remember the Titans, and it is the moment that they go to camp together that that team really bonds and becomes one. And that's what we're hoping that this will be. So uh, we have a plan in place to make this a regular thing and we would just really appreciate the opportunity to go. If you guys have any questions or anything? All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. So is there a motion to approve the football triple midline toss camp? Motion. I'll make the motion. Oh. No? Is there a second? second. <laughs> Any discussion? Holly gets it. All those in favor of approving the, tr the trip, say aye. 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 All opposed, and I say aye. All opposed, say no. Motion carried. Next is the Wisconsin Dell shootout girls basketball trip. Very similar situation uh, as Mr. Hood approaches the board to talk about it very briefly. Um, I'm, I'm just going to share that he, he will share this with you. This was something we talked whether or not it needed to go to the board because the parents actually go on this trip, um, but because it's still school affiliated, just just out of caution, we wanted to ensure that we were following board policy. Um, so Mr. Hood is now back from his uh, baseball game, so he's going to just talk very briefly about the Wisconsin Dell shootout. Meeting was over, so I just came from middle school, Brandywine. Baseball game in Three Oaks. Um, this will be the, I've been here 14 years, I believe fourth time that we go to the Wisconsin Dell shootout. We are the only team from the state of Michigan to participate in that shootout. We'll play teams from all over the country. It is an awesome team bonding experience. Um, lots of great memories. Parents drive, we know, uh, use no school transportation, and the funds are raised through our Brandywine golf outing, which took place and was very successful a couple weeks ago. So. Any questions for me about the Wisconsin Dell shootout? What's the date? 
June 19th, 20th, 21st. I would anticipate 50 or more Brandywine peeps going, and we have a very good time. It's a lot of fun. We take a uh, jet boat down the Wisconsin River. We play a little basketball and have a lot of fun at the water park. Thank you, sir. All right, no questions. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve the basketball trip? Motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. Next up on the agenda is the porn pandemic video, and who's responsible for playing that? <coughs> Mr. Fox is.
she was working with a pimp who had been in prison. And he said, if I see a girl who's alone, I go up to her and I say, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. He said, if she looks at me and says, thank you, I let her go on because I know that she's not vulnerable. But if she looks down at her shoes and says, no, I don't have pretty eyes, he says, I know I've got her. It's impossible to be searching out adult pornography on the internet without finding child pornography. And people will say, oh, no, I never look at child pornography. And I say, oh, really? You mean you've never seen a woman who is 17 and a half years of age? What about a 16 year old, 14 year old? I was speaking to Arizona a few years ago, and uh, a prosecutor was there who prosecuted recidivity and sex crimes there in Arizona. And he's Thank you, Mr. Fox. Where is Mr. Fox? He's over there. Thank you, sir. All right, next discussion item is suspend accessibility to selected books. It was not in your board packet, but I did distribute it prior to the meeting. Um, any questions or comments initially? Yes. What is the reason for the suspension since we're using um, the permission slip right now? Well, the parents get to decide whether or not. Here, here's my reasoning, and I mean, we just watched the video, and I'm, I'm really kind of confused at how we don't see this as pornographic situations in the these books you know we've we've given every board member the opportunity to look up the books and look up the excerpts in the books and it, it takes some time even though it's hard to do to read the sexually explicit material in these books that are just really disgusting demeaning to girls um, and you know I could I could and I may explain a scene that I and I wouldn't do it in, in explicit terms but for us to say that's not pornographic material and then for us to say hey yeah we need this in our library so we we can have students check this out I'm, I don't understand it we're giving the parents the permission to let them choose if they want their child to read it or not. We give the parents the parents the parents do have the parents do have permission to allow their kids to look at pornography if they want. But they shouldn't we it shouldn't be taxpayer funded and nor should it be accessible in the Brandywine Community Schools. I mean, if we view it as pornography, we understand the result of pornography and what it can do to a young man's life, a young woman's life, and what it does in, in the industry in destroying young women's life in particular. 
why, why would we make it accessible within our middle school, high school? If the parents want to do it, they could go to Amazon, they could go online, they could go any other source and find that in that sexually explicit material. I'm not sure how we can justify that. How do you justify it? Well, um, our media center has already stated that we don't have pornography in the library. Um, well, Jessica, can I make a comment on that? I really do want to, because I didn't, have you read any excerpts? I have, and um, multiple books on this list I have read, and none of them have caused me arousal, is what your definition was. Well, that's... So, yeah. You know, I, I really think that, you know, we're talking about our children. This is not time to make just those kind of snide remarks. I mean, it's you know, not a snide remark, it's the definition you gave. And I'm just stating, I've read multiple books on this list. And so let me explain one scene, and I will not be as explicit in one of the books. And I, I email it to Mr. Walker and the rest of the board. But there's this young man leaning against the bathroom wall as this young woman unzips his pants, pulls them down, begin to perform oral sex on him. And obviously, this is a lot, the book describes it in a more very explicit matter. But while that's happening, it explains, the author explains how the young man is thinking about another girl, why this girl is performing oral sex on him, and then says to the young boy, hey, it's okay to ejaculate in my mouth. But, but the, the way I describe it is very, very soft compared to how it's described in the book. I, what, what is the benefit to our students to have that information? What, what does that accomplish by them having that information, being able to read that information? What's the point? Well, currently the books are in the library. So we've already said we're not going to ban books. So right now we give the parents the right to decide whether or not their child I'm, has access to the I'm speaking to the book. specifically to the scenario that he just explained. What is the benefit of any student having access to that type of information? It's not explaining any health class material. It's not doing anything other than promoting sexual activity or or am i missing something i mean if there's another another view that i'm not considering i'm open to somebody explaining that to me but i i don't see what the benefit even if it is just one scene in an entire book there's other opportunities for students to get access to that material if the parents deem it's necessary i don't I'm not understanding what the benefit is of having it in the library. And it's not a matter of necessarily banning the book, it's just a matter of removing the book from the library as an, un as an unsupported resource for education. What, what is the benefit? I'm, if somebody can give me a good valid reason for, for educational support that that book could offer, I'm, I'm open to considering, but I haven't heard one yet. Crickets. Next outburst, you, uh, you will be asked to, to be removed. We're trying to have a discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Like, I'm not, I'm not, trying to be unreasonable, I'm asking a legitimate question. Like, what, it, what is the benefit? If there is a benefit, then we need to keep it. But if there's not, then what is the purpose of it being there? Can I answer that? Sure. The Media Center Committee presentation talked about the educational value of getting kids to read. I, I, I think that's one claim that would people make would make. 
there are students out there who I would imagine could relate to some of the victims in the book. And they might not be comfortable going to a parent with that. They might not, might not be comfortable going to a counselor with that, a social worker with that. But when they can read how somebody overcame abuse to that one student, that, that could be of educational benefit. Regardless of educational benefit, my concern is the legal ramifications in, in protecting the district. So that, that's where I would stand on that. Um, we do have the ability to restrict students via parent choice. Um, the, the media center is aware now of the books that are in the library, it has developed a better screening process. Um, but as far as, you know, removing a book, suspending, whether it is temporary, indefinite, I, I, I worry about the legal liability for the district. So, yeah, I, so let, me, let, me, let me comment on that. Um, and that's, that's subject to interpretation. I had great um, a lengthy discussion with our, our attorney and representative at Troon. And I think that's, that's up to you. It's a subjective opinion for sure. Let me read you something from our policy grant fund 6110. Before you do that, could I just yeah, make one sure comment? Can. So, to your original statement about um, a child resonating or a student resonating with a victim or adversely, maybe even the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, um, I personally have friends who have been victims of sexual violence. Um, I have friends and family who have been victims of domestic abuse. And I can say personally, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, but I can say personally that I have seen what unresolved trauma does to people who experience that trauma in childhood and have not had adequately um, received support in dealing with that trauma and how it plays out in their adult lives. So I, I think as far as as far as students using literary material as an outlet to deal with trauma or issues, I can understand that, but we have a duty to take intervention further. I mean, we're, we're taking steps to intervention in education, in academics, in behaviors. That is an integral part of behavior intervention, or at least it should be. Because if there is unresolved trauma, and if there is an underlying issue that's going on, especially, God forbid, something happens on school property, after a game, or at a school-sponsored event, we still have liability for that, correct? If, it's, if it happens on school property or at a school-sponsored event, we could potentially be open to liability for that. So we have a duty to address issues that that could harm our kids. And and leaving it up to books to resolve those issues, I, I think is 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 irresponsible, frankly. I mean, that may be one element of it, but I don't think that it's responsible to let that be the sole component of addressing issues for a student. Yeah, we, we certainly wouldn't want it to be the sole component, but for some of our kids, that is that is their component, unfortunately. Then um, we need to create a means for them to have alternative means to reach out if yeah, they need help with something. Why make that's, it, a different, that's a different conversation. Why make, right. why make that available? It right. just, we know from studies upon studies upon studies the impact of pornography, and it all starts with one picture it all starts with just one piece of verbiage and it goes from that to the next just like any type of drug would I think we'd be fooling I think we'd be kidding our, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if in fact we we thought something different but let me let me read something from our policy 6110 
It's, this is about grant funds. It said no federal funds received by the district shall be used to develop or distribute materials or operate programs of courses of instructions directed at youth that are designed to promote or encourage sexual activity, whether homosexual or heterosexual, to distribute or to aid in the distribution by any organization of legally obscene materials to minors on school grounds. If the federal government and state government says that we cannot use their monies for this kind of material, why in the world we th would we think it's a good use of financial resources to buy these kind of books and house them in, in our library? Any other questions? I'm, I'm looking at what we have in front of us. We have 41 of these books in our thing. Yep. As a parent, I think I have the right to choose if I want my child to read it or not. And that's what we, that's what <laughs> Doug, Doug and his committee have put together a, a, a way for parents to choose for their children. Would I let my 11 year old read any of those? No, and not at all. But my 21, 20, and 24, they have a right to choose for themselves. When they're in high school and they're 18, if they want to choose, that's, that's them. They're, they're adults. But for me, looking at this, I don't want to ban books. I don't. I don't want to take this out of the, out of the um, library because I don't want any legal course that come down to, like, like Travis said, he reminded me, um, to, our, to our school. We already have enough stuff going on with us right now. I don't want any more. So as a parent, I think I have a right to choose of what's currently in our library. If moving forward, if we wanna look at policies and how to put books in there, that's one thing. But what we have in front of us right now is 41 books right here and there in front of me. And I want, as a parent, I wanna be able to choose if my, my children should read it or not. That's just my Do opinion. we have a complete policy and an implemented policy other than the permission slip, for lack of a better word? So I, I'm not going to call it a policy because it has not been board approved. So we have a procedure. We have a guideline. Um, I think we need some we, definition on that. Because when you explained how school policies work, you explained that each school has their own policies and procedures that they function by, which this policy, permission slip, whatever you want to call it, was something that you developed and the media center is now using. I'm confused as to how that becomes a board policy. Why it's now and requiring the board approval. Right. Can I, can I get back to my explanation then? When you, so, can you answer my question? Cut him off when he was talking. Okay. So, board policy, no. It's not going to go in board docs. Handbooks are policies. Those are board approved. That is a policy approved by the board. So I'm not going to call it a policy. Uh, right now it's a procedure. Right now it's a guideline. If a student is going to check out a book, and, and, and I, f I kind of forgot what the question was since I was interrupted. I, I really don't know what I'm answering right now. Do we have a policy that, or a procedure that other than check, signing a permission slip to control or restrict access to the books? I know they've been put behind the counter. And I know that parents can sign a permission slip for essentially for their students to have access to those. Is that is there anything else surrounding that protecting access to this information? Thank you. So um, right now the procedure is the books are behind the counter. Uh, if if a student is going to check one of those books, and again we haven't sent anything out to parents because I don't know if there's going to be a policy developed. I don't know when that will be. I don't want to send something out. Um, you know, last week and then three weeks from now, I have to send something out. There's a change. I don't want to cause any confusion. So what we are doing, we, we've, I've, I've spoken with the media center. Those books are behind the counter. If a student wants to check one of those books out, which I, I, I'm looking into it, I do not believe they've been checked out in recent months. Um, if a student wants to check one of those books out, because it's behind the counter, 
the whoever's working in the media center will contact that student's family and, and say, regardless of their age, you know, your child has asked to check this book out. It is on a restricted list that we're keeping behind the counter. Um, would you like to sign something, give an access to these books in general, the books behind the counter, to your child? If the parent says no, the child may not check that book out. If a child is 17 or 18, they're going to get the same call. And, and like the, they said um, last meeting, that parent would have to sign something restricting access to their, to their child at that point. We're just not sending anything out to the families. Number one, just not to cause any confusion because I don't know what's coming down the pipe. I don't know how soon that's coming down the pipe. And um, number two, the, these books don't seem to be of great interest to our students at this time. So then subsequently to that, um, if, if there is restrictions on the books we currently have, if there are restrictions on the books we currently have, what what is the procedure for vetting new books coming in and determining whether they get special placement or whether they're... So the board has suspended already the addition of any sexually explicit books. So there there's a review process, um, and I don't remember all the terms, all the sites that they use, but they, they look through... Again, we, we've learned that book ratings are different. Um, so they will look through anything that is questionable, suspicious, they will, they will do the research again. I don't have this written down in front of me, so I don't remember exactly what it is. They did a great job presenting it at last month's uh, board meeting. So the board has already suspended the addition of any new sexually explicit material. Um, the, the media center is aware of that and they have a process to prevent that from happening. I, a, absolutely, that that is in place and, and it being followed too. So is there a need for there to be a policy presented to the board if there's already a procedure in place? I, what I'm getting at is there's been feedback from community members that the explicit book committee hasn't done anything, but in fact it sounds like there ha maybe the committee itself hasn't done anything, but it sounds like there are safeguards being implemented to accomplish what that committee was intended to accomplish anyway. Is that so, so you asked, is there something that needs to be brought to the board? Because there's already guidelines in place. And, and I would say yes. Um, you know, if a parent calls in and they have concerns about their child's cell phone use, my, you know, my, grade, my child's grades are down and I don't want them using their cell phone at school because some teachers do allow it, some don't. We make sure that that's communicated to the teachers and that child, if they're seen on their cell phone, we're certainly gonna take it away whether that teacher has that policy or not. Uh, as principal, I've received calls where, hey, I found out my child's been out of class a lot. I don't want them using the restroom during passing or uh, during class time. They're only to use it during passing time. We pass that on. So this is just like any other parental right. They have the ability to restrict it. However, I would like a, a not a board policy, but a, a policy adopted that it's, it's board approved. It would basically be like kind of like a resolution. It would be procedural that, that we can say each year, here is a list of restricted books, here's how we handle this, and it, it would be formal versus just the, the traditional parent right. I, I, I would like to formalize that. So yes, there is something that I think should be brought to the board, absolutely. When can we expect that so that we can get well, something? That's out? the, so, Part of the committee work is for us to develop either a policy or a resolution. So what we did is we received, uh, Ms. McCombs and Ms. McKee had a meeting with uh, Mr. Fox and his staff. We had the presentation from Mr. Fox and his staff the previous meeting. They're right now garnering uh, they're doing their their research and then eventually they will have their first committee meeting to have an open discussion at least on the first steps of either developing a policy or procedure um, and and creating and finally or to finally create a a final product for uh, to recommend to the board for approval or so certainly for a vote I think that's where my issue is though I mean there's you know, the right hand's blaming the left hand, and both hands are trying to do the same thing, and we're not getting anywhere. So well, I, I think if, 
I don't think you weren't at last at the last meeting, no. so I don't know if it's the right hand blaming the left hand. I think it was just a misunderstanding from some community members that either we had to approve this or not, but we certainly understood what is in place. Um, not that we agreed or disagreed. We just understood what was in place that Mr. Fox and his team was working on. Uh, that did not need a board approval. They could move forward with that, that procedure or that protocol. But it was still the intention of the board or the committee, the explicit book, sexually explicit book and material committee to continue to move forward with their work to, again, to make a final recommendation to, to the board on, on what to do. Whether, again, whether it be a resolution, a policy, or both. So I guess, I mean, because we're kind of getting down a rabbit hole. So I guess ultimately yeah. I, I would like to know who exactly is going to be responsible for presenting this policy the committee. proposal to the board? The committee, that, that, that committee was formed in order to do its work to create a policy and present it to the board for a recommendation. The board would then take it under consideration as a discussion and then follow up with an action item. That so, is yet to be, that is yet to occur, but is in the process of being worked on. So back to the discussion item, with respect to suspending accessibility to selected books, I, I feel like we can't, aside from what we've already discussed and our personal opinions about it, I feel like it, if, if we don't have a policy presenting an alternative option, then it could be perceived that the, the presentation is banning books so well it's it's not let me obviously we're not, not we're not banning books right, so if you, if you remember what um, if you remember what we did initially our decision was to stop any additional inventory right so we didn't ban books we just said hey no more books are coming so this discussion item is to put a hold on something until we can further our, our provide a detailed definition of what we want to do going forward. And this is still not all books. This is sexually explicit books that That's have been right. suspended. That's right. The list, the list that, that we have, yes. Well, so no. do we have an anticipation date of any meeting or work being done by that board? Committee? Not yet. Yeah, but it's, yeah. we're 17 weeks, we're at the end of the school year at well, this point. Well, no, I, I get it, but if you remember the process we went through and there was some confusion on policies, we are working on it, we don't have a time frame, but it takes a lot of due diligence and work and data collecting. Here's a thing I want to say, Ms. Pomerica, you said that we're banning books. Everyone still has access to them. If we were banning books, it wouldn't be available anywhere. We're just you know, our position or my position is in opposition of housing those, that pornographic material in the library and make it available to our, our children. If we look seriously at the data, there's tons and tons of data that supports the, the harm that this kind of material can cause any child, whether it be male or female. Secondly, to Mr. Walker's point, he said we use this maybe these books were something that would be you know therapeutic there's no data supporting that there's no data supports that if there is i'd like to see it i really would because that that would be a good argument so i i kind of want to get back to the the point of suspending the books and and the policy because i feel like they go hand in hand so is there can we discuss a potential deadline for lack of a better word of when we can expect something even if it's a preliminary presentation just just to at least start getting some discussion going on the policy because I, I would like to see this happen sooner than later I mean I know it's detailed I know it's not something that we can just hastily do but now that we've, we've worked through the policy issues I feel like we need to really push forward. I don't know. I, I could say in the next month, by the end of June. By the end of June? Yes. I mean, even even just a preliminary, hey, this is mm -hmm. this is where we're going with this. Like, 
Yeah, maybe if we just had, Feedback, in a, if we yeah. had even an outline, hey, here's where I think we need to, to go, but we need to fill in the blanks or maybe be a little bit more granular, but if we could have a, a deadline of at least of, of that to show some significant process. I just feel like a lot of a lot of what's going around is speculation, right? Like we we're, we're working through this, and you know, it, there's not a lot of two-way communication about it because we're trying to work through the kinks. And, and granted, not all information that the board has access to is is available to share with the public. But I feel like if we at least try to, you know, present an outline like we've requested, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you can't you can't move forward if you don't know where you're coming from. So which that was said tonight. So if we can at least start getting an outline together, start getting questions formulated and start showing some progress, then we might be able to kind of put some minds at ease and, and actually get somewhere with a policy. Working with Mr. Fox and his team and, and everybody on the committee. So what are we defining the current procedure that's in place? A permission slip, a policy, a school procedure? How is that defined currently? I would call it a current procedure. Um, that gives parents the right to restrict books from access, uh, access to books for their children. Okay, so if then that procedure is approved by you, the principals, the administration? I, I approve of it. You approved it, yep. okay. And, and again, and I. It will then go into the handbook for next year since it is an approved middle school high school procedure is that correct no because the board has to approve the handbooks so again the, the handbook is a policy right now it is a procedure that we are adhering to and again I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the parental right to you know ask their ask the principal for their child not to be able to do something we don't call every parent who we see their student on a cell phone and say, hey, your child is on a cell phone, do you want us to take that away? But with this one, we are taking the extra precaution because the board has asked us to suspend the addition of the explicit, explicit books because we know there is some concern somewhere over the material in the books. We are taking that extra step to reach out to parents when this happens, to say, your child has asked to check this book out. Would you like to grant them access to this book? Have we had parents we, that have said, no, we don't want our children to have access they have to, to say that. We have not had to because nobody has come in to check these books out. We did have one parent say, I want my child to have access to these books, okay. but, but we're not really asking for that right now until the child goes to check the book out. Um, I, I'm not sending, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not sending anything out to the masses, to the families, or anything like that. I don't know if we have something at the end of June. I, I just don't want to cause any confusion. So right now it is a kind of as it happens, then we're taking that extra step to reach out to parents. So it would be premature to say if the procedure is working or not, considering there hasn't been the demand for implementation. Is or parents may not know about it. Right. And it could, be, it could be from a lack of interest in the material, or it could be just because it hasn't been you know, shared with parents, but but the students can't check the books out regardless. No, the, the student Sorry. cannot check the book out until that parent call is made and, and access is given. So, I mean, could you say it's premature? Yes, we haven't been able to test it out, but they have been instructed, it is a directive, not to check a book out to a student without getting that parent access, or uh, granting access to their child first. So, so, that's, so that's changed then from what was presented. Before it was, I think, 10th through 12th that, or a certain age, they could check it out on their at their own discretion. No, up up through up through age 16. So the the recommended policy that would go to the board that I asked to go to the board that the media center current presented. Current procedure. Yeah. Current procedure. The proposed policy that I rec recommended go to the board was I believe, it, and so in the middle school, high school, I don't remember the minimum age, obviously, our youngest person in the middle school, high school, 
up to age 16, if it goes to the board for a policy, up to age 16 would require a parent permission slip be turned in at the start of the year to grant those students access. That same permission slip would go to the parents, but at age 17 and 18, if we don't get it back, they would have access. So you don't have to, you, you have to limit it, you have to limit it at age 17 and 18. You have to opt in, you have to opt into it. Um, so up ages, whatever up to 16, you have to opt out. Ages 17 and 18, you have to opt in. So right now, all students, middle school, high school, we are making the call. So even if a student is 17, we, instead of the call is, would you like to grant your child access to this book? It is, would you like to revoke your children's access to this book? Okay. So ultimately, Why we... what, I'm, what I was trying to get at was, if, if we are already implementing this procedure, can we, is it sufficient to get it written up and presented to the board as a policy and vote on it and get it implemented instead of reinventing the wheel? Yes, and I think that's the work of the committee to present that. Yeah, so I would suggest the work of the committee, which is chaired by Ms. McCombs and co-chaired by Ms. McKee, because they are doing and collecting data and reviewing data that would help them make policy that might be different than the current procedure. Okay. okay. So why I, don't we do this? Could Go I ahead. ask one more question? Yeah. Um, are all of the school board policies currently in the middle school, high school handbook? We don't put school board policies in okay. the middle school, so high school handbook. why would this one be put in the handbook? This, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, this so, would this no, this would not be a board policy. Like this is so we can write a board policy. We can we can write any policy we want and put it in board docs. Go to the school website, menu, board of education, board docs. We can write any policy that we want and put it in there. However, if it's not vetted by the attorneys, in other words, if it's not recommended by the attorneys, so Neola writes policy, Neola has attorneys that approve their policy. Neola shares it with all their clients. We could write a policy and put it into board docs. That is board policy. What we, are, what we would recommend to the board is a policy. So right now it's a procedure. If it comes to the board, it becomes a policy because you're approving that. It goes in the middle school, high school student handbook or any, any, live, uh, excuse me, any building handbook. At, at that point, it is policy. It is something that has been approved by the board. Right now, it's a directive from me. It, it necessarily doesn't have to be followed. Um, if I find out it's not, then that would be something for me to address. If it's board, if it's not board policy, if it is a policy adopted by the board, we are required to follow that. So there's a difference between board docs. Spring Thank update you. That is going to. my question. Yeah, Thank spring, right. so spring let's, update is going to go in board docs. This is a policy that would be approved through the adoption of the handbook. We would, we would, and what we would do, we don't have it right now, obviously. So at the next meeting, you're going to approve the middle school, high school handbook. You would approve this, and we would direct Mr. Winkler and Mr. Hood to insert this in the handbook before the start of the 23 24 school year. And okay. at, at that point, is is policy. It's not a board policy, however, it's board approved. Got it, makes sense. All right, so why don't we do this? We have, if we, according to Robert's rules, we can table this discussion and we have 90 days to bring it back up. So that would give the committee, uh, we have a commitment from the committee to at least have a, a nearly completed recommendation for the board and provide a presentation by the end of June. So that presentation would take, take place in July, at the first meeting in July if we have two meetings, obviously. But we then have 90 days to pick it back up if, in fact, we motion and second the motion and we vote to table this discussion. But, so, Mr. Walker, when do we approve the handbook? What's the date? We will be approving the handbook at the June 12th board meeting. So um, we would need the policy by then? Well, we don't. We, well, we, we, can, don't. We, can, we, no. we can approve the policy and it would need to go 
we would need to make sure we get it as soon as possible to the middle school, high school office to have them submit it for print for the 23-24 handbook, uh, which those, that, that goes to print end of June. But it doesn't necessarily have to be in the handbook. If it's a board policy, it doesn't have to be in the handbook. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't a be a policy. board policy. It would be a board approved policy. Which can be added. Which right. can be added. Yes. We're fine. We're, we're playing a lot of semantics tonight. Right. Okay. Right. So um, it, was, it was suggested that we table it. Is there a motion to table this discussion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor of tabling this, the uh, suspended, suspend accessibility to selected books, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carried. Next on the agenda is board reports and requests. Any questions or comments? You do? Oh, here. No, 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 no. Go you first. Go, go. Um, I just wanted to. Make a point, I did a quick Google search on the porn pandemic video, and it was put on by Family Watch International. And Family Watch International, according to SBLC, is classified as a hate group and also supports the criminalization of homosexuali homosexuality in both Africa and the United States. So I'm disappointed that it was shown. I think um, there could have been other avenues um, to get your point across. So that was an opinion of Center, what's it called? What you mentioned the acronym, but what's the complete verbiage of the website that you looked on in the group? The Poverty Law Center. The Poverty Law Center. That's very, is, so that's, that's the only opinion you looked up, looked up, one opinion? That was a two minute Google search. Yeah, so it was just one group's opinion of that other group and that substantiates that opinion? It's a legal group. Doesn't matter. That's just one group. Okay. I'm just making clear that it's. Any other questions or comments? I do. Um, and I just want to say how proud I am of the schools and the, and everyone when, when it comes to Brandywine. Um, we got some information from Mr. Walker, which I'll let you know if you want to say. Um, our third graders last year, we had kids that got, could, have, could, could have been retained by the state. This year, we have zero. None of our third graders. So I just want to say, in this last year, Mr. Walker, thank you and your staff, the third grade teachers, the second grade teachers, Merritt, um, to see that we had some kids in the past that were, could have been retained by the state, and we don't retain them. The state says you have to retain them under the No Child Left Behind, to say this year we have zero, that is amazing for our district, and I want to thank you very much. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. Um, that is, that is, you know, and again, you, you said it, that is our third grade team, that is our whole Brandywine Elementary team, that is the Teaching and Learning Council. That is the merit team, that is the interventionist, that is the principals, that is the food service who nourishes their, their bodies to, to feed their minds. Um, that is our paras, that is our title aides. It, 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 is, it is Brandywine that, I'm brand new here, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> but thank you, it is, it is um, incredible when we have had students, in, in Mr. Boger, Ms. Lazat, was it 2019 that that was implemented? 2019 they started the retention the third grade reading law and since then I believe we have had students every year who have been suggested to be retained um, we've had students who have met exemptions and have not chosen to be retained uh, this is the first year and we got not only did we not have any we went from seven to none um, in one year and so there's there's a huge group of people out here to thank for that and the one group we haven't we haven't mentioned is, is the students who are working their butts off every day uh, congratulations to them. I wanted to make a comment. The last meeting, I somewhat misrepresented a report, and Mr. Walker and I have had several discussions since then, but in part of my comment, I mentioned about our second grade teachers. The intention was not to put a bad light on them um, at all, but 
just the general comment was made to just encourage all of us to realize that we can do better, just like any individual can, we as a group can. But our second grade t teachers are awesome. Um, um, I know that they're dedicated, um, and I did write them a personal email stating the same, but I did want to make sure I corrected that because it, it no way, shape, or form was I directing and insult them or, or trying to attempt to put them in a bad light. Um, I just want to piggyback on that real quick. I know it's getting late, so I'll keep it short, but I feel like it's important to say that, at, at least for me personally, the intention behind any of this discussion or inquiry is not to assign blame to anybody. It's not to put down any of the staff. Um, our kids would not be where they're at without the staff. You guys are with our kids the majority of the day. When they're not at home, you have them 100% of the time. So I, I personally feel like it's, it's imperative to say that, at least for me, the intention is not to assign blame or responsibility. It's, it's really coming from a place of inquiry and trying to understand what goes on because I'm not an educator. I, I, that is not a field that I wanted to pursue. Um, and so I have the utmost respect for educators. I want everybody to understand that when, when you come into a position from a place of wanting to contribute as best you can and not knowing anything about what that involves, but knowing that you want to help like I did, it, it requires some investigation. It requires some discussion and asking questions and trying to understand. And that may come off as um, undermining, it may come off as skeptical, um, but the intention is truly to find a place of understanding so that we can move forward and work together. Um, so for what it's worth, I just wanted to say that because I, I don't have all the answers, but I have some ideas that I think with discussion and with collaboration might help. Um, it was said this evening, I think very eloquently, that you can't move forward if you, if you don't figure out what you need to improve on. And, and that's at least my intention for, for what I'm doing here. So I just wanted to say that. Any other comments? Next, we move to the hearing of visitors. I would just ask if anyone else has a form they plan to turn in, if you could do it now instead of having turned in. Right. Having turned in while people are speaking and it's disruptive. If anyone else has a form to turn in, please do it now. No? Okay. Ambrosia Neldon? <coughs> do you know how many we have? All right, my name's Ambrosia Neld and I live on Bell Road here in Niles. Like so many meetings this year, there were many egregious moments in the April 24th board meeting. Perhaps most notably though, Mr. Payne read the definition of pornography straight out of the dictionary. As a refresher, that definition is printed or visual material containing the explicit description of display or display of sexual organs or activity intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic or emotional feelings. Bear with me, folks. A bit of, I'm a bit of a word nerd, but I'd like to break this definition down. While Mr. Payne seems focused on the first half of the dish definition, the part that says explicit description or display of sexual organs, the most crucial distinction in the definition is that the sexual descriptions must be intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic or emotional feelings. In other words, like Ms. Crouch said, the author's goal must be to arouse the reader. One of the most frequently mentioned books during these meetings has been John Green's Looking for Alaska, the one Mr. Payne brought up today. This book is a beautiful story about a teenage boy's quest to understand why a female student he loved committed suicide. It's not every day we get a peek inside a writer's mind, but in this case, John Green himself, the author, offered some perspective in a YouTube video about the controversial scene which contains oral sex. I don't think there's a single halfway normal person in the world who would find a single thing in my book in any way arousing, Green said. 
There is one very frank sex scene. It's awkward, unfun, disaster, and wholly unerotic. He goes on to say, the whole reason that scene exists in Looking for Alaska is to draw contrast between that scene when there's a lot of physical intimacy, but it's ultimately very emotionally empty. And the scene that immediately follows it, where there's not a serious physical interaction, but there's intense emotional connection. The argument here is that physical intimacy can never stand in for emotional closeness, and that when teenagers attempt to conflate these ideas, it inevitably fails. It doesn't take a deeply critical understanding of literature to realize that looking for Alaska is arguing against vapid physical interactions, not for them. This is a perfect example of the point Mr. Doug Fox made at last meeting. When taken out of context, these scenes may make parents uncomfortable, but in the vast majority of challenged books, the scenes are short passages and used to make a point that isn't at all sexual. For whatever reason, some members of the board claim that the goal is not to ban books in spite of a discussion item on today's agenda to suspend accessibility to selected books. Again, the Merriam-Webster definition of ban is to officially or legally prohibit. Regardless, I prefer to use the other common phrase for book banning, which is book challenging. Appropriately, books that are often challenged tend to be challenged because they challenge the reader. They make us uncomfortable, causing us to view a new perspective through critically. Thank you. Jasmine Levine. Hi, y'all. I'm Jasmine Labayan. I live in Kalamazoo, Michigan at 1312 Waverly Drive, but I am an alum. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of things tonight. First and foremost being the walkout that I'm sure you witnessed during the playing of the porn pandemic video. And I just wanted to express a few of the, the thoughts that were behind that. I don't want to speak for everyone, but first and foremost, I want to make it clear that the relevance of comparing pornography to literature without considering the context of these stories and the development of these characters it's, it's apples and oranges, y'all. That's, that's a big frustration. What is more frustrating to me is that you all seem to misunderstand how these meetings are supposed to work and what is appropriate. This is an open meeting amongst you all. Your job is not to pontificate to an audience of community members, which is clearly what you were trying to do. You were trying to argue your agenda using a piece of what is honestly propaganda by a source that is questionable, as was brought up earlier, and that is wholly inappropriate. Second, I want to speak as an educator. So I am a professor of communication. My job is to conduct research and to teach about communication, specifically about sex and gender. And so this is something I know a lot about. And so when, I, you know, I, I want to give some, some kudos to Ms. Seastrom because I actually really do appreciate the questions that you were asking, and I think you were asking those from a place of an open mind. And so I appreciate that and want to answer um, from the perspective that I have as an educator that there is value, and there's, there's a theory that's called sexual script theory that, that stems from another theory just called, just called script theory that says that when we're exposed to narratives, that depict these situations, we learn language. We learn how to have conversations about difficult things. Many of you might have seen the movie recently, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, which was a book that I think a lot of us read when we were in our prepubescent age. And they talk about things like training bras and menstruation. That yes, we learned about in science class, but we didn't have those characters to relate to. And I remember reading that book and thinking, oh, now I know what words to use to ask my mom about things like tampons or training bras. And so that's what sexual script theory is about. When we have exposure to stories about sex, we learn language that helps us to ask questions of trusted adults. That really does give us an opportunity to become more comfortable with this language. It was brought up earlier that sexual assault survivors and domestic violence survivors find catharsis in these stories. And I will tell you, as a sexual assault survivor, I personally have experienced that. Heidi Moore. All right, 
Hello, my name is Heidi Moore. I reside at 1433 Bell Road here in Niles. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about the porn pandemic video that you guys played tonight. Um, there, are parent, there are board members that keep seeming to insist that there is porn in our school, whether it be in the library or the curriculum pertaining to sex ed, or so it seems. At the April 24th Board of Education meeting, the board questioned diligently both committees of the library and the sex ed committee. The library brought forward the fact that they have put into place a policy to make sure that younger kids in the middle school, high school building are un unable to access any of the books that you guys are concerned about. But yet here you are still pushing the pornography card. There is no pornography in Brandywine libraries. There is absolutely no reason that that video should have been played at the board meeting tonight. It has nothing to do with Brandywine schools, but has everything to do with how parents parent at home. Let parents be the parents. You guys can parent your own kids how you want them to be, but we should have our own voice about our own children. And as far as suspending the accessibility to selected books, first of all, I'm glad that that wasn't an action item tonight because you guys don't know what all of you guys want. Parents should have the right to decide what is allowed for their child and what is not, not the Brandywine Board of Education. You should not have the ability to have a vote on removing books from the library because of your political views. As a parent, I will encourage that you allow the library to have that form for parents to sign if it isn't already in place. I'm also recommending that that form be put on the, branding, on the district's website so that parents can have access to it in an easier way if they're unable to come into the school. That way they can sign it on a Google Doc or whatever it's on and turn it in. But in all in all, the parents should have the decision for their own child. Joe, sorry, M, I can't read the rest. Joe M. On Portage Road. Okay, Malia Deno. Hi, I'm Malia Denno, a senior at Brandywine, and the paper that I just handed out to you is a flyer about We the Students, the student-led group that is intended to introduce our say, students' say, in conversations like this. Now, I would like to list some accomplishments that have been made by our students here at our schools within the past couple of months, along with some activities and events, as well as as well that were quite successful. A student was elected regional officer for FFA as a sophomore. We had career day at Merritt and the elementary school pa this past Friday where kids got to meet local experts and workers in their certain fields. The sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and high school band had their spring concert and played very well. The seniors have been acknowledged for their hard work and accomplishments throughout their high school career last Tuesday at the award ceremony. Triple Airs received top score at State, sorry, State Choral Festival a couple weeks ago. Our middle school track team won the River Valley invite by 79 combined points, and we have almost one third of our team qualified for the Mega Star meet on May 31st. Now, why am I bringing up these events? I'm doing that because you haven't. Certain members of this board have been so focused on this imaginary porn pandemic that they have seemingly forgot about all of these students. 
the, the children, they swore to help prosper and help grow. But a majority of you haven't even cared about the students, the parents, or even about the community. In fact, you have no clue as to what's going on in this school and the amount of students you, who feel unheard. Yes, you have used the par, par, paraliminate, paramilitary procedure to maintain and rule the majority, but, these, but this board has failed to protect the rights of the minority, or in this case, the students. And I so, and I so do wholeheartedly believe that unless you start listening to the, to the minority, you are no longer using Robert's rules of order. And if you no longer use the par parliamentary procedure, that means this assembly will no longer be valid. You will lose your power and your decisions become void. A new assembly will have to be created and some of you may have to be replaced. You have very few options to choose from. Now, as you keep making your poor decisions, choose wisely. Thank you. Elisa Skinner. All right, here we go again. Elisa Skinner, Redfield Street, current Brandywine student and editor of We the Students. Let me know if I'm yelling into the mic, as apparently I have had a past problem with this. Anyway, I am here speaking again because it seems that four of you on the board have an issue with doing the right thing. Brandywine, as I hope you are all aware of, is a public school. I hope you also realize a public school means a nonpartisan school board. If you look up the definition of nonpartisan, it means free from party affiliation and bias. Caring about Brandywine students does not seem a part of your agenda. It seems that the agenda you guys are pushing for is to politicize this school. Banning books or taking them out of the library or whatever you guys want to call it has been one of the most controversial political event agendas since before World War II. As a student, this frustrates me. Brandywine is not a place that should be used as a stepping stone for your political views and games. If I was on the school board, I would be focusing on more important things, such as transportation problems, keeping teachers in our district, and more accessible resources. You haven't mentioned or brought up those, those things. Yet, somehow the problem of book banning and pornography is discussed when I haven't even seen a single student access those type of materials inside of the school. And that is where your guys' focus should be, is inside of the school and inside of this community. Look around and you will see that the audience of this board meeting is more bipartisan than the school board itself. I find that quite sad. That a bunch of students, parents, teachers, and alumni can come together easier than you guys can. So as this academic school year draws to a close, what can you honestly say you have done for me and other students attending Brandywine apart from make everyone feel uncomfortable, unheard, and angry? and creating an untrusting relationship between the school board and the Brandywine community itself. That, for me, is not the type of legacy I would like to have inside of this community. Years from now, when you are off the school board, you will not be seen as great people. Instead, you will be four people who have chosen to, chosen to try and tear this community apart. So maybe, before that happens any further, you should listen to what all of the community members have said and start doing the right thing. Debbie Carew. Debbie Carew, Meadowview, Buchanan, Michigan. As an English teacher here at Brandywine, I teach skills of critical analysis as part of my job. How to differentiate facts from opinions, how to infer meaning, how to identify logical fallacies. So after my comments at the last board meeting were gaveled down as somehow false or inappropriate, I feel the need to provide critical analysis of actually what happened. Here are the facts. I conducted a survey of teachers in Brandywine that showed a significant majority of them are negatively affected by these, this board's actions and attitudes. A notable number would consider leaving the district if the negativity paired with the unilateral and uninformed decision making continues. From there, I can make an inference. Teachers are of the opinion that a majority of this board does not respect their professionalism or value their contributions. The survey reflects several issues, starting with perceptions of campaign messaging from last fall. 
distrusting accusatory words from your mailings or candidate profiles such as stop the indoctrination were guilty of just trusting that public school system had the kids' best interests in mind. Then, the knee-jerk oversight new committees were put into place. This structurally demonstrates distrust of the collaborative work of both the superintendent and staff on already existing committee work. We the Parents posts um, uh, were repeatedly shared on your campaign page, and then they continue to post on their page us against them messages, like, teachers should fear parents again. There was a social media post asking who would choose the teachers union over parents to make educational decisions for children. And I have to wonder if you really understand who the teachers union really is. So let's talk logical fallacies. It's a logical fallacy for you to make every issue into an either or. Either parents should determine their children's education or teachers should. That's called a false dilemma fallacy. Education is not an either or proposition. It should be both and. Both parents and teachers play an important role in student learning. Another logical fallacy some on this board have employed is the straw man fallacy, trying to make the teachers union into the boogeyman. Your teachers, the ones employed by this district who pour their heart and soul into the children of this community every day, year after year, those teachers themselves are the union. It's not some mysterious group plotting nefarious schemes. A union is a group of individuals, teachers in this case, who join together to build collective strength around their profession. If you don't trust the teachers here, unionized or not, I'm not sure where we go from here as a district except down. We deserve better. Do better. Kevin Smith. Good evening. I am Kevin Smith, teacher here at Brandywine, and I live in South Bend. I'm here tonight to talk about this board's fixation on pornography. It feels like, since January, this board has been waging a crusade against pornography in Brandywine schools. With how much time and energy has been spent on this issue, one would think the board has some specific evidence of about a book or books that are currently in our libraries that could be classified as pornography. But they do not. We know this because several people have asked for such evidence, but all we've been provided are excerpts curated from a book review website. Nothing specific about what pornography may or may not exist in our libraries. To be clear, we do have some books that on that list in our library which are considered sexually explicit, but that does not make them pornography. Pornography has a specific definition we've heard multiple times, not just what you feel is porn. In interest of that specificity, let me repeat the def uh, that definition and a couple others. Pornography, the depiction of erotic behavior, as in pictures or writing, intended to cause sexual excitement. Sexual, of, to, or associated with sex or the sexes. And explicit, fully revealed or expressed without vagueness, implication, or ambiguity, leaving no question as to meaning or intent, or open in the depiction of nudity or sexuality. By those definitions, me stating, or even writing down that I am a married, heterosexual, cisgendered male is a sexually explicit statement. But there is no reality in which that statement could be considered pornography, because it is the intent which matters. Is that statement intended to cause sexual excitement, or does it simply reference sexuality? Likewise, a book being sexually explicit does not mean it is pornography. There is no pornography in our libraries. And yet this crusade continues, bringing us to tonight's video. I could speak at length about the rampant logical fallacies. Or I could bring up how addiction to any substance or activity affects the brain the same way this video said porn does. What if I talk about the fact that this video was produced by a religious political lobbying group labeled as an anti-LGBTQ plus hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center? No. Instead, I'll talk how this video, as presented tonight, does not follow the written bylaws of the Brandywine Board of Education. As given in policy 0123B, philosophy of the board, the board declares and reaffirms its intent to establish policies and make decisions on the basis of declared educational philosophy and goals. What policy was that video in support of? What declared educational philosophy is articulated by that overly biased piece of propaganda? That minors shouldn't be allowed to view porn? Great, we're all in agreement with law. But unless this board can provide documented evidence of the existence of a work of pornography that is currently held and circulated in our libraries, I would suggest this board abandon this campaign against books, 
which is never a good look for a governing body, and focus on issues that are actually impacting, impacting students here at Brandywine. Sarah Skinner. My name is Kylie Craig and I live on Bond Street. I'm a senior here at this school and I'm here to talk about books. I consider myself an avid reader. Throughout the years, I would look forward to reading Fridays in my English classes. Most of the time I'd be using library books, but sometimes I'd bring a new book I got from home. When I was about eight years old, my mom brought, bought and read a book titled A Child Called It, and it made her cry. She later lent that book to me to read. That book was banned way back in 2013 because of the explicit content within it. If we look beyond simply labeling these books like a child called it as explicit or inappropriate, we can actually start to see the benefits of keeping these types of books in our curriculum. Spending time to seek out this information yields some very intriguing results. A great example of this comes from the lead of the teaching and learning team at George Mason University, Mariah Kirker. She provides a very insightful perspective on the issue. When asked what are the benefits of having diverse perspectives and characters in the K through 12 curriculum, she answers, many K through 12 students do not have the luxury of being able to travel beyond their local communities. Books help students learn about the vast world they may not be able to physically access. She also teaches on the idea that books teach empathy using diverse characters and perspectives, which in turn allow the students to think critically rather than blindly following what they've been told. Students are clearly heavily influenced by what is present in a classroom, so it's no surprise that it includes not only the content in the, in, in the individuals, but the way the information is taught to them as well. Christina Dobbs, a Boston University assistant professor, and Pamela Mason, a Harvard Graduate S School of Education senior lecturer, did an interview with Harvard University on this idea. Dobbs states children need a safe space in which to graph pull with hard stories, confronting difficult issues in books that they may, have also, they may also encounter in real life and be tricky territory, but that's part of why we have books. By creating a safe space for students and teachers alike, healthy discussions can take place in order to teach and provide students with the information they need to navigate through life. If a child is exposed to the situations and issues beyond their horizon in a healthy and productive manner, they would be better equipped to handle the situation if they come across it in real life. But there are more issues to discuss than the positives of adding this literature and curriculums. I'm alluding to the issues that lie within eliminating the banned books, the negative effects that will come if we no longer teach those concepts. Using the same article with George Mason University and Kirker, she states that limiting access to books might solve one family's concerns about their child reading a particular text, but it removes the opportunity from another child. Book banning has a ripple effect that imp impinges the rights of other readers. It takes away another parent's choice to make that decision for their own children. It directly invalidates the rights of parents and guardians who may not agree with getting rid of the books. This is backed up yet again by the art, an article published by the University of Colorado Springs where UCCS... Sarah Skinner. No? My name is Sarah Skinner. I live on Emerald Drive here in Niles. Um, I sent you folks an email on the 19th, and since my email box was not overflowing with replies, I would like to point out a few facts in case you didn't have time to read it. According to the Supreme Court in the Miller versus California ruling, you do not get to decide what is considered obscene or pornography. That's the court's job, and they have set up the Miller test to help them decide. There are also other court cases, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, and the Board of Education versus Pico, that state that removing books based on content violates students' First Amendment rights. A more recent ruling from March of this year in Llano County, Texas, where 12 books were removed from the library's collection a federal judge ordered that they be put back on the shelf. The judge stated that the removal would not stand up in court as it violates constitutional rights. 
And by the way, it's already illegal for publishing companies to sell truly obscene or pornographic material to any library in this country. The Michigan Library Association contracted a full-service public opinion survey research firm to conduct a statewide survey on library issues. 71% of all respondents gave Michigan libraries a positive job rating, and it's actually higher in our region, 81 to 87%. 83% of all respondents would, would support state legislation that would protect the right of the public to read what they wish. That is also higher in our region, 90 to 97%. 75% of all respondents said that they agree that we need to protect the ability of young people to have access to books from which they can learn and understand different perspectives and help them grow into adults who can think for themselves. An 80% majority of all respondents agreed with the statement that individual parents can set rules for their own children, but they do not have the right to decide for other parents. And that is actually higher in our region as well, 88%. So as you can see, an overwhelming majority of Michigan, Michigan residents do not agree with what you are trying to do in our library. Please reconsider your choices and your position on this board. Let's try to focus on the real issues, retaining excellent staff, hiring bus drivers, our student success, maybe feeding the children. Uh, those would all be better options. Thank you for your time. John Darby. Yes, uh, John Jarpy, uh, resident of, of Brandywine, 2475 Weaver Road. I spoke to the board in January, and one of the topics that I brought up at that time was school culture. I was an adjunct professor for Western Michigan University, and one of the courses that I taught was about school culture. So let me just give you a real brief uh, rundown about that. Okay, the top school culture is called the accountable culture. That, nobody ever re really reaches that. You've got a collaborative culture. You've got congenial, where everybody kind of gets along. You've got kind of a laissez-faire school culture where things just kind of go on their own. And then at the very bottom, you got toxic. A toxic school culture where, where people certain groups of people, their goal is to undermine and kind of mess things up in the school. What I saw tonight were some excellent, excellent examples of school culture, the STEM presentation, the recognition of the staff that Mr. Walker gave, the Partnership for Children, the curriculum presentation was outstanding, outstanding. The sports trips. And then came the video about the porn, what, what was it called, the porn pandemic. And from there, folks, you are contributing to a toxic school culture. And you're going to, like, like Ms. Carew said, you're going to undermine your, you know, people. I said this back in January. It only is reinforced by the sad data that she gave you. People will leave. People will not come here. People will hear about this. There's news people here tonight. And they're going to see what's going on in Brandywine. And they're not, they, they, nobody, it's not news when the train runs on time, folks. The news is when there's something bad happens. That's what the media does. They're not going to talk about the outstanding things that I just spoke about, about those kids and about the, you know, everything that's going on, the sports trips, all of that. They're going to talk about what Mr. Payne showed with this video and the reaction from people like me. And that's sad for Brandywine. You've got to change. 
I'll still have a cup of coffee with you, but that coffee is getting damn cold. Oh, and there is, there is a policy about materials. It's been there forever. It's been there, it's been in handbooks forever. Lou Ann Vidmer. Too long and now my stiff. I'm Luann Vidmar. I reside in South Haven, Michigan. I work in Berrien Springs. I represent 17 school districts, 27 union contracts. So I guess you would say I'm the bogeyman. I'm here. It's hard to fathom how four people elected to sit on the Brandywine Board of Education could change the course of this district. Currently, Brandywine Community Schools has been on a stellar path of quality education for students. Don't fix what isn't broken. Please do not go down this path of destruction. Stop using the cloak of parental choice to cover up a political agenda put out by various ultra-conservative and alt-right organizations such as Citizens for Renewing America. This group put forth a guide on how to stop critical race theory. Their subtitle, which I have with me here, reads, an A to C guide on how to stop critical race theory and reclaiming your local school board. This has been sent out to almost every community in Berrien County. Webster defines public as affecting or concerning the community or the people, maintaining for or used by the public or community, not a select few. It appears that what this current school board is looking for is control, which can be found in private or parochial schools where parents choose to send their children based on social, economic, and religious beliefs. For a select group of people to voice their political, religious beliefs on a community is abhorrent. It's a misuse of public tax dollars. Brandywine has 81 highly qualified and educated teachers. This group consists of educators with 42 bachelor's degrees, 39 master's degrees, with a combined total of 1,201.5 years of educational experience. This doesn't include the many quality support personnel and administrators whose dedication to the students and the parents of this community are on display daily. My suggestion to the Brandywine Board of Education is to step back and let these exemplary employees do their jobs without the board's interference. I personally think that 1,000 201.5 years of educational experience trumps five months of sitting on the Board of Education. Any, any unfinished business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. So, second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor to adjourn say aye. 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 All opposed say no. I'm the one that decided one board meeting a month is a good idea. You need that shirt. That was a joke. I was trying to be funny. The, the reason it's four hours is because you, you're doing it in one time instead of two. I, don't, I got a lot more to say, but I'm not going to because... Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. They were rude enough during public speaking. I mean, I, I, I thought it was cute, but...